Okay, everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining. Okay. Tonight's class, we're doing in honor of the birthday of Yo Peso. May the Hashem give him a good, 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 super good year. In the material and in the spiritual. Much, much, much blessing to you, you all, and all that you need and all that you want. And it should be a super duper year. A year of great, great, great. Um, prosperity and everything, and a lot of light and a lot of bracha. Okay. We are, this week is Parsha's Vayetze, the Torah portion is Vayetze, and the traditional, the regular book. This course is on Song of Songs. It's almost like the Songs of Songs was a closed book. On What was the heading of it? Yeah, that was a few weeks ago. I forgot the, the, the heading of it. And this week, um, so I looked in the index if any of those Shir Hashirim discourses were said on Parshas Vayetze. Well, I found one. This discourse that we're going to learn now on Daf Lamet Ches was said. Um, in the year Tov Kuf Samaches, which would be the year 18... So in the this week, Parshas Vayetze. On I'm going to say a mimer. Whatever. Um, A daughter of Freidel, story on Rosh Hashanah. Who had to bury separation between men and the deceased after the past. exceptional, special for her. Rebbe, the great Rebbe, would hide. See this, that is woman scholar. Perhaps great love that she she had a, a male and this find just if you're doing a, if in, in areas like this if you do a Hebrew search put it in Hebrew you can find things Britain couldn't find it's funny because they say the grandson Reb Baruch and doesn't say which Reb Baruch this is it must have been his wedding that this this course was said. But the Rabbarach, Rafraidel's son, who was married to Rabbi, to Rabbi Yom and Kletzker's. Uh, anyways, that's the story. And his chasana must have been in the uh, Tavkov Samaches, even though that year there was the other famous chasana. The Zhlobin chasana was that year, which was another grandson of the Alter Rebbe who married the granddaughter, or the opposite. The granddaughter of the Alter Rebbe uh, married was like, the biggest chasen and then in Russia, everybody came because they uh, did a, got to, the big two courts became unified. Anyways. Songs. Gods and I select. Without a number, it can't be counted. As we're going to soon see, looking on this, is my other, by the one who gave so let's understand. So there were many queens. Combines are kind of Abraham. actual creation. There's no perception of oneness. There's a perception of many. And the perception of many translate as it goes farther and farther. As creation evolves, it gets worse and worse and worse until you get to a point where there is only many and there's no singular source. And the world is completely fragmented and we can God... God forbid live in a complete godless consciousness without any recognition that there is a singular source creating us all and is the reality of all of us. That's blocked. So, but the Shekhinah, she perceives the, the unity of God, the oneness. And that's why she's called Achas because she takes in, a woman takes in. She's Knesses, she's gathering in that oneness. 
translate that into, translate into us, into, into, the, into each other. We, in our, because we have a unique soul, that our soul is a part of the Shekhinah, we have within our capacity to experience the oneness of all of existence. We don't have to be splintered. We don't have to live in the fragmentation of an outside world. When we tap into the quiet, inner, inner, deepest point of our inner core, we find within it the place where we are conscious or could be conscious of, if we, if we reveal that, and live in absolute unity and oneness. In other words, when we perceive and see how everywhere we look, touch, feel, smell, and, and, and everything is all just an expression of one singular oneness. That's the truth of our soul. Our souls know it in an absolute way because our souls are, why? Because God illuminates into our soul. He shines himself into our soul. From God's perspective, let's, let's, let's look at it. From God's perspective, is the creation a contradiction to his oneness? Absolutely not. From God's perspective, all of existence is completely absorbed in him. And it's only him. It's only from the perspective of the creations that we are separated, separate beings and entities and so on and so forth. The Jew has within him an neshama and he can receive to receive that echad. And that's why what's our motto as Jews? What's our primary statement? What's the, what is the Jewish statement? Shema Yisrael, hear Israel. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem our God. Hashem Echad. Which Hashem Echad doesn't only mean there's only one God. Hashem Echad means Hashem is uni Echad. He's the only being. Everything is, there's nothing else but Him. We know that the contempl what we're supposed to meditate when we say the word Echad is it's made up of, of three letters. Aleph, Chet, Ches, and Dalet. So Dalet represents the four directions. And Dalet is four. Ches is eight, which represents the seven skies and the earth, seven heavens and earth, which make up between the Dalet and the Ches, it makes up all of space. All of space which is the sum totality of everything. And what are we saying? It's all one. It's all echad. Why is it one? Because it's all existing. What's its power? What's its reality? The, the Aleph. Take that Aleph out. Take that singular, powerful source of energy, which is God, out of creation, and all of existence D disappears instantly, has no beingness. So if the whole power of the Chet and the whole power of the Dalit is the Aleph. So Echad, Aleph, Ches, Dalit. But what do we say? Before we say Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, we say Shema Yisrael. Now Shema means hear, listen. You're basically telling yourself, listen Jew, now, you're not making a public announcement. If you would go over to the, to the podium or to the bima and give a knock, Shema Yisrael! And everybody would be quiet. What do you have to say? Shema Lokeinu, Shema Chot. But you're not doing that. Everybody's saying Shema together. So who are you talking to? Tov. Saying, hey Jew. Shema Yisrael. Here. Listen, Israelite. You're calling yourself. You want to wake up your inner being. But there's a deeper meaning. The Mittler Rebbe on his discourse on, the, on this mimer says it's a deeper meaning. Shema doesn't only mean listen. Shema means also to gather in. Gather in. So what, what, what is it saying? The unity, the unity of God that we Israel, we the Jewish people, are capable of experiencing beyond all other peoples in the world. Beyond, all, even angels can't experience it the same way we can experience it. You, we're unique. Unique in the ability that we, can, that, that we can experience the oneness to the fullest. And as we're going to see later, and share that oneness with the universe. With the rest of the world. And 
bring the world ultimately to a state where everybody will experience the oneness. Educate all of humanity. But the power of that conviction and that, that experience of oneness is not just because derived from our, our minds. When we think about the world, we realize the things couldn't have created itself. So we realize that there must be a creative energy that's creating it. There must be a God who created this intelligent design. It's so beyond marvelous that it just couldn't happen by accident. So he knows a God. Then we know there must be just one singular God. And we know that he's everywhere. He's creating everything. In it. And therefore we in our minds perceive the oneness. That would mean that what kind of perception is it? We don't have direct access to the oneness. We're living in a multi experienced world, in a multi-diversible, you know, say, world of many. Is that what I'm saying? We're living in a world of many, but we're deducing with our intellect that there must be a one. And I'll give you an example. It's like, for example, we can deduce that there's neutrons and electrons here, and that everything is made up of atoms. But it's not a first-hand experience because I don't see no atoms and you don't see no atoms and you don't see no neutrons and electrons. But you know that scientifically they, in a laboratory they proved it. And they see it. They can see it. And therefore we kind of accept it as an absolute truth. But still, what am I more concrete of? What's more real to me? What's a deeper conviction? That there's a table over here or that there's energy and protons and neutrons and things spinning around at an enormous speed over here? What, what's more real to me? What is, what, is ta- what is gonna have more of an impact on me? The table. Because the table, I, I don't have to deduce it. It, dedu- it proves itself to me. You know what I'm saying? I don't, have to, I don't have to calculate its existence. It, it shows itself. The uniqueness of the Jewish people is that the oneness of God is not something that we need to conjure or develop or reach to a conclusion through our minds everything else in the creation needs to do that besides the Jewish neshama on a soul level why because to our soul God is visible the oneness that singular oneness that fills all of creation and all of existence is unified with that one singular energy that's eminent that's creating everything ex nihilo from absolute nothing into something is perceived by the soul and that's what we mean over here, that, th- that the, the Jewish souls, the Shekhinah, and which each and every one of us is a part of the Shekhinah, is called feminine oneness. Feminine oneness means we're just open and God inserts that consciousness into us. He reveals himself to our soul, not us having to, 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 to come to the understanding that he is. It's, it's, it, and in terms of sharpness of that conviction, the sharpness of that experience is infinitely stronger when you're being shown a truth than when you are deducing its, its, its reality. So that's what the verse is saying. Achasu, zuknesas Yisrael, this is the Jewish, shumakar nishmas Yisrael, it's the source of the souls. Venekras achas, she's called one, she receives Mibchinas Yisrael de Leela. She receives from Israel from above. Shanikra Echad. She's because the Dean but mean Knesses Yisrael also means that's interesting. Add one more little little thing. And that is, I mentioned earlier, one of the Shekhinah's names is Knesses Yisrael. And I said, why is she Knesses Yisrael? because she's the source of all souls. Now he's adding another pirush in the words Knesset Yisrael. She's called Knesset Yisrael not because of her influence downward into the souls, but, or the source of the souls, but also because the Shechina is the vessel, she's the wife, she's the vessel to receive God. To be a to allow God to, re- to reveal himself to her as he truly is. That's the reason why she's called Knesses Yisrael. 
she takes in Israel. Who's Israel? Israel over here is not the Jewish people. Israel over here is referring to the masculine side of the divine. It's called Israel. Because this week in the Torah portion, when we read about the marriage of Jacob and, and, and Yaakov and Leah and Rachel, so in addition to its simple meaning that there is a human being called Jacob and there's two wives called Rachel, eh? this also has a spiritual meaning where Yaakov is representing the masculine side of God and Rachel and Leah and Rachel and Leah are two dimensions of the Shekhinah. So Yisrael in the ultimate meaning is, is, is not the Jewish people below, it's Hashem Himself is called Yisrael. Hashem is called Yisrael. Knesset Yisrael means she receives Israel. She's receiving that illumination coming from Yisrael. The same idea that Achas, Achat, which is the feminine aspect of oneness, is receiving the Echad, receiving the oneness. Okay. Vinikras. Now, once we know we are called, we are called Achas. Hashem says, that notwithstanding the greatness of the Torah, but you are dearer to me, you are closer to me. And there he starts describing what are her qualities of his beloved wife. He says, my dove, my tamasi, the one who completes me. So what does that mean? V'nikra tamasi, or kamai merizal, the sages say, tamasi te'umasi. Te'umasi means my, my twin. Now, just like two twins um, are born together. And because they're born together, they're really incomplete without each other. They complete each other. Usually, you know, you have someone, you're a self you're a, you're, you're a person onto your own. But when you have a twin, especially if they're, um, what are they called, identical twins, so they're kind of all their life, they're kind of huddling with each other because they, they know that it's almost like in this birth, they're just a half, they're a half a being without the other. In that sense, God says, I am incomplete without you. You complete me. And that what? Because through the, the souls of Israel, we do something really, really great for God. Because through the souls of Israel, it brings the unification above of male and female. What does that mean? It brings the unification of male and female above. He's going to discuss this at greater length in the discourse. But just in a nutshell, female is the Shekhinah, but really, female represents everything that receives from God. Everything that receives from God are all of creation. All of creation. The universe, everything that's in it, all of existence receiving from God. So it's all the female. God is the male. All right? Because he's the bestower of energy. He's the, he's, the, he's the source, life source. Until the souls, until the Jewish people come into the world and do the tikkun that they need to do, the rectification that we need to do, which that rectification comes through our observance of mitzvot, had there not been this tikkun of mitzvahs, had do we not have that rectification that we do, then the creation and the creator will always be at odds. There won't be a harmony between the two. And that means that there is no marriage between God and the world. The infinite and the finite remain separated. The, the, the point of Israel, the point of the Jewish people, is to facilitate this union. Now what? That within creation, within the world, that it initially experiences itself separated and therefore limited and finite and separated should be felt and should be realized the singular oneness of God. 
In other words, when we are done with this world, when the Jewish people are done with this world, earth is going to be holier than heaven. The physical is going to reveal God more than the spiritual. And what is it going to reveal? Only oneness. That there is none but Him. That means that the world's creation, the feminine and the masculine, God, are going to be unified to the point where they become one. Hear that? And that's why God says, you complete me. Because till you come, there is a disconnect in my, in my, in my, in my domain, there is a separation, there is a breakage. You bring about a synchronization between the Ein Sof, which is the infinite, and the finite. By revealing that the finite is, is really, in truth, nothing other than just a finite reflection of the infinite, and therefore it's really also infinite, and as we're going to see. And that happens, that tikkun is done only through Israel, only through the Jewish people, and it's done only through mitzvot, as we're going to see, mitzvah observance. So, and that's why we're called Tamasi. We complete God. We make Him, in which sense? We bring the masculine and the, and the feminine together. And, 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 and that, they, that they become one. But what do we see, however, from here? Mehinei mezeh muvan, we see from here, what we see from here is that souls are higher in level than the Torah. Because that's what the verse is saying. The Torah is good. Queens, concubines, girls, great. But you are, you are the real, you are the real macher over here. You're the real, you're the one that counts more than all. Now there's another proof to this. Now this is a shocking idea. Because Jews, until the Baal Shem Tov came along, this idea that the Jewish people might be higher than the Torah was a very, very, very unlikely idea. Jews always perceived the Torah as something that we... For example, how does a Jew connect to God? How is it always understood? That a Jew learns Torah and through studying Torah we, we forge a bond. That the Torah means the Torah has a deeper union with Hashem than the Jewish people. We learn Torah and therefore we connect. But he's saying no. That the Jewish soul has a higher connection. Now this can also be derived from another teaching of the sages. On, on the verse that says the Torah Moshe taught us. Morasha, Morasha means it's an inheritance. The sages say, Altikra, my Russia, don't read it, Morasha, which means an inheritance. Ella Urasa, but read it, betrothed. Urasa, which means change the shin to a samach, and now it means betrothed. Shatoiruhi Urasa, the Israel. Moshe gave us a Torah, Tzivalano Moshe, Mu'urasa, which that Torah is now engaged and betrothed Kehilas Yaakov to the, to, the, to the congregations of Jacob. What does that mean? It means the Torah is our bride. If the Torah is our bride, bride and groom, what's the relationship between bride and groom? The groom is the is the benefactor, and the bride is the beneficiary in the sense that she's, he, is, he, he is the mashpia, he is the influencer, and she's the influenced. So if the Torah is called our bride, that also indicates the same idea that we said before, is that the souls of Israel are higher than the Torah. The Jewish people are considered the groom Kala, and the Torah is called the bride. So it's understood that the souls are higher than the Torah. But how does that make sense? Don't we find other places that it seems to describe that the Torah is 
the Torah makes us holy. When we study Torah, we become holy. But Makar Matsinu and other places we find Sha'amar Azal, the sages say, Trask Shadim Miskashrim Dabida. There are three things that connect one to each other. It says there are three things, the Zohar says there are three things that bond. The Jew, the Jew, the Torah, and God. Three knots. Three knots. The Jew, the Torah, and Hashem. And how does it work? We, the Jewish people, study Torah. So we can't knot ourselves to God, because how do we perceive God? We can't. So we, we knot ourselves to the Torah by studying Torah. And the Torah is knotted to God. So by being knotted to the Torah, and the Torah is plugged into God. We plug in, it's almost like we plug in, in modern terminology, we plug into the Torah, the Torah plugs into God, and via that extension cord or that, we're, we're plugged into God. So we see clearly that the Torah is an influencer on us. Now we're saying, no, in this verse and in that also thing about Torah, Tziva Lano, it implies that the Jewish people are influencing the Torah. So which one is it? Ulahavin, Lagamr Shah is a Benimtsa Movin La Hapach from there it's understood the opposite. Lagamr completely the opposite. Shah Torah Hula Maila Bama Dragam in Israel. The Torah is higher than Israel. Ulahavin has kalanal, so to understand all the above. He's going to explain a phenomenal idea about our Nishamas, about our souls. Hine Ksiv. Oir Zaru Allah Tzadik. There's a verse that says, Light is planted for the Tzadik. Tzadik is the saintly one. Light is planted for the tzaddik. If you're not, if you're wondering where that comes from, that verse, um, I'm not sure the origins in the Tanakh. I can tell you now, but you might be familiar with it. It's the opening verse in the Yom Kippur prayer before Kol Nidre. We say Or Zaru Allah Tzadik Kol Yishrei Leiv Simcha. So the Or Zaru Allah Tzadik is an oh, it's in Tehillim. It's actually Friday night davening. <laughs> so funny, we say it. I, I, I was sure it's in Yeshaya somewhere. It's in Tehillim, it's a Friday night davening. Light is planted for the tzaddik. Okay. In any case, um, what does it mean, light is planted for the tzaddik? Brief, and this is just one brief, brief, brief idea. The souls of Israel are light. Why are they light? Because they're reflections. They're here to illuminate. The, what is light? Light is an illumination of a source. And light, right? Uh, it brings it, 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 it. And then you, you, you can see what's really going on. So via our soul, for instance, in our own lives, because we have our soul, we know, we know we're not, we're not, um, blocked by the blockages. I mean, it's possible. People can ignore their soul. People can shut down their soul. People can stifle their soul. People can uh, overshout their soul. If their soul is feisty and fighting, they can make a lot of noise and distract themselves from the constant nagging of the soul. But the mere fact that we all, especially as Jews, have a very, very strong sense that life is purposeful and meaningful and we're not just here to have a good time but there's something greater in life which is something you see by all Jews even Jews that are not into religion and into observance have a sense that there is something meaningful in life now I'm not saying it's only Jews a lot of non-Jews too but in Jews it's very very strong a very deep conviction that we have to you know save the planet save the elephants right? something we, 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 life is more than me eating pizza and just li I eat and drink and have a good time and then I die there's a strong sense of uh, old, and that's because deep inside we feel God we feel purpose not everybody not everybody um, um, associates that with a godly consciousness but that's what it really is because if we're here by accident and there's no God then why What's a purpose? There's no purpose. You just live. You're just a a product of some uh, chemical uh, reaction or whatever it is that produced the human being. So just exist as an accident and enjoy yourself. Like what, what else is there to it? 
But the fact that you have a conviction that, that there is something that I have to do in this world, and that I, I, I'm searching for meaning and I need a higher meaning in life, that's because at the core, <clears throat> there is meaning and, there is, and who creates meaning? Only a God who, who exists before the creation, who creates the creation for a certain purpose. And that's why <clears throat> it's felt in every cell, especially in the Jewish soul that has a deeper investment of God, it, it sense very deeply this purpose. And that's why the neshama is light, because it's not dark, it's a luminous entity. But what do we say? Light is planted. What does that mean, light is planted? This luminous entity called the soul, which is also a tzaddik, a righteous one, because the soul is incapable of doing anything wrong, only because of the body and other things that we get involved with the wrong things. But the soul itself, because of its utter awareness of God, cannot disconnect. It always wants to do and always connect it. But what happens to that oil, that light? It's planted. What happens when you plant something? Yeah, first of all, it gets covered up. That's number one. It's, it's completely concealed. Number two, it rots and it decays. If you can speak to the kernel or to the wheat or to the thing as you're taking it, if you can hear it, you would hear it crying and begging, please no, I'm, I'm a seed. Why are you putting me into the soil? I'm gonna rot, I'm gonna decay, you're destroying me, you're burying me alive. Uh, yeah, but we know that. We know and we, and we tell the little seed, don't worry. Precisely there is where you will act. I know you're, you know, you know you're a seed, you know your potential, but you got to go into the earth. You got to disintegrate, you got to get frustrated down there until you become completely not. There's nothing left of you, not even a trace of you. And then, boom, you'll come back not as a seed. You'll come back as a magnificent tree with branches and twigs and, f and leaves and shade and, and fruit, not just a seed, a whole fruit, not just one fruit, hundreds of fruit. And if the tree will be an apple tree for many, many years, thousands of fruits. And each one with an ability to, to recreate and create and create and you can create infinite apple trees if you continue planting these seeds. But the only way you're gonna unleash that infinite potential and unbelievable growth is in the ground where you'll disintegrate. And that's the reason why God does not listen to the soul when the soul is kicking and screaming when, the, when it goes on a piggyback ride on the angel and the angel takes the soul down, down into a body. And the soul is thinking, what in the world am I going into a body for? And when we think about ourselves, why did God take such a noble entity like a soul, which is a little piece of God from above, and put it into a body, that, and the body is so dense and thick and so obsessed with self and not seeing the bigger picture? And for many people, what happens to the soul? It gets buried in the body and starts, starts to disintegrate because she, can't, she wants her way. She wants to learn Torah, pray. She wants to all day admire God's greatness. And instead, she has to start thinking about business, other stuff. Get, and what does that do to a soul, especially if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing? It causes rotting. The soul utterly decays. So you'd think it's a horrible investment. Taking souls and putting them into bodies is a bad thing. But that's the story. It's when the soul fights its way through that darkness, when it like disintegrates, to the point where you almost think you're giving up on this Jew. You think, forget about it. There's no spirituality left in it. Talking to them, they're not interested. It's precisely when you can't even tell that there's a soul there anymore, when it's like totally, and the person became so materialistic. And so, you know, they, sometimes you have this amazing thing. Suddenly the person finds themselves at a point in life where they don't know what to do anymore. And then they start asking questions, and then they come back, and then they're so invigorated once they find the answers, and once they rediscover their soul, they're so unbelievably excited, and their passion in their observance of commandments 
is so much more than the guy who's never become disconnected and never dis- disintegrated. And therefore, they're like producing mitzvahs at, at a speed and with an energy like no one else. Generally, we call that the Baal tshuva, the guy who's coming back from the outside. So God does that with all of our souls. But even if one does not become, when he say disintegrated, we don't have to mean that one completely neg- neglects their Jewish duties. The mere fact that we can kind of, our spiritual consciousness pauses, why don't you say pauses, more than pauses, gets like suspended. And we're operating in the realm of the earthy and the physical. But yet, what can we do when we're in a physical body? What are we able to do? We're able to do the one thing that we can't do in heaven. And that is we can do a mitzvah which is, can only be done in the physical. And every mitzvah is a point that we release into the, into the universe, into, into the earth. That's, that it contains, with because it's the will of the Ein Sof, it's the will of God, we inject and infuse a point of, so to speak, the essence of Hashem into the world. And when all those points will get together at any given moment, now actually I mean literally any given moment because we're holding in the Messianic age. At any given moment, all this, all the, all the accumulation of all these seeds will in one instant reveal their, their potent light and this entire world will become so conscious and so filled with the awareness of the singular being that's creating it every second, that it will cause such an overwhelming dread and fear, not in a negative way, that the verse says that people will run to caves to hide, where will they be able to hide from the intense revelation of God? They'll feel ashamed of being so ignorant and so oblivious to God's existence. And how how could have I been so, so idiotic in not seeing it? When Mashiach comes, the lights will turn on. But when will that light turn on? And as a result of what? As a result of the millions of mitzvot that was done by all the souls that were planted. In other words, had the souls remained in heaven, oh, yes, this potent power to bring the Ein Sof into the world is a Jewish, and that's what God is, is, is pointing out to is the, is, is the Jewish contribution to the world. And with all the contributions of medicine and science and all these things, it's all secondary to the primary contribution of Israel, and that is divine consciousness to the world that will be revealed when Mashiach will come. It's a result of all the mitzvahs we've done in the plantings. And that's the meaning of Oyer Zaru al Tzadik. The light is planted. The light of the Tzadik is planted. Let's read it inside. It says, Light is planted to the tzaddik. The souls that are called tzaddik, righteous, they are light. They are planted, they are sowed. Below, they become enclosed. Our souls come into a body of flesh and blood. Hagashmi. The physical body of flesh and blood. Bechdei, but this has a purpose. Shal yodam yetzmicha. Through them there should be sprouting forth. Betois vis harbe, betoisefes harbe, with a, a very great addition. Liyosam shochas gili oirin seif parachu lamata. What's that? What's going to come back after this, after the planting? Let me put it this way. When you're putting a seed, you have to always, um, you have to always um, evaluate your investment to the return on your investment. If you're planting a seed and you're going to get back a seed, then you didn't benefit anything in planting. But if you plant a seed and you get a tree, that's, that's, that's an enormous profit. A seed is a little thing like this. A tree is, an, is a potential for infinite... The truth is the seed has the potential, but the seed, 
The tree is magnificent. So now, our godly light that we produce is not just the value of our own soul. That's all we say. Hashem puts a soul in this world. Hopefully that the soul can re-identify with a soul. It gets dark and ultimately the soul can reclaim its dignity and its reality and its light and its life force. And then if I can reveal who I truly am, that I'm a godly light in this world, then it's good. And it came after darkness, so that's even better. No, but then I planted a seed to get back a seed. When the soul was not in a body, it was also an entity of light. It's not that. It's that when the soul goes down here in a body, it's only in its sojourn on earth, during its period when the soul is going to be on earth, is it going to discover its infinite potential. It's going to reveal not just the godliness of itself, it's going to reveal infinite, every neshama, every soul, it is responsible for a boundless revelation of God that is going to take place after Mashiach comes as a direct result of every single one of our souls being planted here on earth. And that's what he says, a lot, a lot of addition, to draw forth the revelation of the infinite light, down here below. How? It's through studying the Torah and the observance of the physical commandments that we can only achieve when we're in this world, in, in, in the material world. Kashi is bar lekamon, like will be explained soon further in the discourse. Bezer session. For mamish, so this idea is literally kedug masazria. This is similar to planting shazoy rimba aretz agashmi, in which we take a seed and we plant it in the physical earth. Shazoy rin garin echod. You plant one seed, venir kav baaretz. It disintegrates. It rots. It decomposes in the earth. Venitzmach mize achakach. And then it grows out after that, an abundance, a lot, a lot, a lot of seeds. So you're, you're doing physical mitzvahs. That the souls of Israel do in this physical world, which is similar to that planting, Megaren Echod, from one seed, Nasa al yadezet smicha, we're holding the second to the last line on this page. Nasa al yadezet smicha, this causes a planting, a, a, a growth, viribui, and an increase, betois vis viribui, with an added and abundance, lias gili, or nisayf baruchu lamata, for the revelation of the Ain Sof to be revealed below. Ulahoven zeh, so to understand what does this mean, what is the deeper meaning of this? How does this work? And to understand this. Meaning, what exactly do the souls, what exactly do the souls contribute? And how is this contributing? How is this great, potent, like, what essential, that's the question, what essential power are the Jewish neshamas, are the Jewish souls of Israel, by being transported and planted on earth, what is it that, that they are releasing that is changing the, the, the dynamics of creation? Why is creation, which is created by God, so ungodly, despite the fact that it's created by God? And what fundamental change is being done through our mitzvahs that should bring about such a dramatic change that the world becomes super godly. How does that happen? So there's some kind of rewiring that is done. There's some kind of... Or let's put it this way, we are downloading something into creation. And it's that new download that enhances the creation to be into this it, into this, um, what we call, um, 
unparalleled or, or uh, shaloi be'erech, how do we say? Incomparably higher uh, godly experience than what the world hands within it to begin with. So we're downloading something. What is that? Well, the Havan said to understand this in Iksiv. And, and so let me, just, let me just tell you whatever he's going to say in a nutshell. He's going to explain that the creation, the way God creates the world, is only through a ray of him. Not of the substance of him, but a ray of his light. The nature of a ray is that it's stronger next, it's, it's, it's stronger closer to its source, and as it gets further from its source, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's the reason why creation is of such state where the higher parts of creation are more godly conscious and the further you go, the more dim that ray becomes or the weaker until it reaches a point where there's no trace of any of that light. And then the world is shrouded in complete denial of God, darkness and denial of Hashem. So the change comes about when we can transmit and draw down or download into creation something higher than the ray. And that is of Hashem's essence. If we can take the actual substance of the Ein Sof, not the ray, bring in of the substance of the Ein Sof, and when that is here, then this world is transformed. That's beyond light. It's not the light, it's the essence. It's the source of light. And when we draw that, there's no limit. That, for, that, 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 for, for that source, it makes no difference if it's light, is, light and darkness are equal. So it can be down here and be in the darkness and bring the truth even in the darkest of places. Because it's of essence of Hashem, it's not light of God. So who are the transmitters of essence? The Jewish souls. Why? Because our souls come from the essence. Since our souls are called children, a child is your essence. In a child you draw from your essence of your being to create your child. So a child is an interesting being. On the one hand, he's not you. He, he or she become separate entities of you. But yet, there's still a continuation of you. Not, 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 they're not a projection of your ideas. You're not, they're not a projection of your likes or dislikes. Your child doesn't have to have the same ideas or the same likes and dislikes of you. But they have your DNA. They have the substance of your, of your brain, the substance of who you are. And on a spiritual level, they have the substance of your soul, even if it doesn't. So, there is a creation that's created out, so to speak, outside of God, even though it's not really outside of God, but because of the diminishment of light, it experiences itself separated from Hashem. And then, into that separateness, God transmits Himself via each and every one of us as a child. And then we, by doing the godly things that God instructs us to do, can insert from within creation, actualize or reveal the essence of Hashem within the creation, and that will over, and not overwhelm, but that will take in the creation into the experience of Hashem. So we, store it we store it. Yeah, it's like in, it's inside of us, and now we. And that's right. And here's the thing: He's going to explain that mitzvahs, for instance, every mitzvah or every Torah teaching of Torah, is a thin is is a channel. Because Torah is Hashem's wisdom. So when you're saying a teaching of Torah, you're channeling, you have a, 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 
a um, sort of like a into this creation, into the separate entity, you have an, an intrusion, so to speak, of Hashem in here. You have his wisdom. But here's, here's, here's the limitation. Here's, here's the, it's only that idea. It's only that one thought. It doesn't produce anything else. The Mishnah is the one Mishnah, the one thought. The, the, the passage, the halacha is the one halacha. It's a godly halacha, but it's one idea. The, the Nishama is the only one who, is, who can produce and can copy itself. And can produce and produce and produce. Can reproduce. Just like, I'm going to give an example. If someone, you know, studies your ideas or your so that, that's an extension of you your idea your 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 but it's just that idea but if you create your child you, you create a child the child will have a child and a child will have a child it's a reproduction of yourself infinite why is that? Because your ideas and your, even your, your deepest thoughts, they're, they're emanations of you. They're still not the essence of you. Only in the transmission of the creation of a child does someone draw from their essence. It's almost like you've made, you've, you've, you doubled yourself, you've cloned yourself in your children. That's really what it is. Why? Because you're taking of your essence. And if it's essence, it's a self-sustained entity. You know what I'm saying? And, and therefore, it, it is you, completely. So it can, and it will produce from its essence. On and on and on. So the only... It's not duplication of the summer, but, but to a certain degree it is. It has to have its... On the one hand, because he's, it's a different person, it has its own unique thing, but the, 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 there, is, there is enough there of you that is you. You're... you're yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's a continuation of self through your children. Chazal used the term in terms of body. Bra kara davi, a child is the, is the leg of the father. So the highest power to insert divine, the abishter, into the world is through, is through the Jewish souls. Much more even than, now how does the soul unleash that light? Through Torah, mitzvahs, and so on and so forth. But that can go on to all infinity because it's an neshama that has the essence. So it's the deepest insertion in the world of something of Hashem. Higher than, than any emanation, even of the even Torah and even Torah on the highest levels. It's a difference like... I'll give you, I'll give, show you, I'll, he doesn't say it in this mimer, but with different mimerim it says a similar idea. You know, if, if you teach a student your ideas, then the student knows your ideas. And if they're a smart student, they can build and develop the idea further. But it's still limited to that idea. And you're not creating in your student a brain. They have a brain, and you're transmitting ideas, which is a product of mind. You're not giving your student your mind, something your mind produced. But can I give my student my entire mind? Say, here, here's my mind. So now, it's like you have your teacher 24-7, and anything I have, you have your mind. Well, you can't give it to your student, but you can create a child. 
which the child is not the the emanations of the brain, it's the brain itself. It's not the production of the mind, it's the mind itself. So the biggest godly transmission into this world is that Hashem has children in this world. And those are the souls. And they bring an infinite presence of the Eberster into the world. Each one releases. Now, here's the thing. Let me give you something. If the kid, sometimes you have a kid who has the father's brain, but goes in a complete different direction than the father. To the point that like they have a complete opposite philosophy, a whole different reality. And uh, had someone not known that this child is a child from that person, they would never guess. So then even then, even if you have that then, then you're better off with the student. Because the student at least is reflecting the philosophies, the ideologies, the ideas of it. This person is not doing anything, it's just like a complete separate. But basically they took their father's brain and ran away in a different direction instead of being a duplication of the father. Let's say in a case where the duplication of the father is a good thing. Let's say the father is Albert Einstein and the kid went ahead and, and used the brain for like just silliness. So then you took your father's brain and wasted it on Irish guide or on like really bad stuff. So then what? So of course, it's not enough to have a Jew in this world. The Jew needs to be a little Eberster. What do I mean by that? The Jew needs to be a little Eberster. He has to behave like the Eberster. When the Jew learns Torah, so just like God learns that Torah, these are God's ideas, now you have the Eberster's brain itself. I'm sorry for being... I'm, I'm speaking very strong now, but this is just the MS, duplicated, so to speak, in this world, in each and every one of us, in each and every neshama. And when we are learning what God learns, so we're producing his intellect, his, his, his seich. We're studying the same subject like his. So then we are being a carbon copy of him, his mitzvahs that we're doing. But within the world, that's the nakud. And because it's of the essence, we can produce further and further and further. Ultimately, what happens? The world becomes filled with the substance of the Lukus, with the substance of the divine. Enough that Mashiach is here and we experience in the physical world, Einoid Movade, there's no more. But let's understand something. The way I'm making it sound a little bit is they'll become a bunch of little gods, chas v'shal. That's not what I mean. Because we're dealing with absolute unity. On the level that we're talking about is when the neshama, it's 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 being a, a a a extension of God in the world in the sense that it doesn't feel itself separate, in the sense that it feels itself part of God's unity. So it's a transplant. The reason why I'm using transplant because it is entering into the zone where the oneness is not felt. If it wouldn't be entering into the zone when one is not felt, I would just say it's an extension. But because it's entering into the zone where the one is not felt, it's not an extension. It's like coming from here, being planted here, but within here, it's peeling away the, the chitzainius, revealing the oneness, and experiencing its, itself. When we say a child in this sense means nothing other but a reflection of my source. Revealing my source. But the Jew much deeper than anybody else. Than anything else. Let's read inside. Allah and Zet understand. That's going to go really fast. Really, really, we, we discussed most of the Maimar, so it's going to go really quickly. Allah and It says, Your kingship is the kingship of all worlds. So, what is the deeper meaning? So, first, the Al Tareb is going to develop the idea that the worlds derive their existence not from him, not from Hashem himself, but only from his kingship. That's what I mentioned earlier, only from a ray of him. Pidish kolelamim, all worlds, shehem ribuidavavos, these are myriads. Hishtal sholos kolelamos, the chain-like evolving order of all worlds. Debiya, of Bria Yetzir and Asiya, which is creation, formation, and and completion, which is not only three, which is really shehem ad enkates, which are literally 
infinite worlds. There's infinite worlds. Kamashakasa, like it says, Ayesh Mispaligadudov, is there a number to his to his battalions or to his troops? There is no number to the amount of worlds that there are. It goes on infinite. But yet, Im Kolzeh, notwithstanding their enormity, Makar Vishadish Khiyusam, the root and the source of their life force. That both enlivens them and brings them into being. From nothing to something. is not God Himself. It's not the Abishter Himself. It's only from His kingship. Now, kingship is, is, is it's His kingship. Yeah, but it's only His kingship. Kingship is, is external. Because a king's, the, the meaning of a king being a king is only in relationship to his, outside of Him. So the king, right? What is the king? He runs a country. If he's not running a country, other than the outside, there's no meaning to kingship. So that represents a, 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 a dimension in one's existence where they, where they relate to the outside. Now anything that relates to the outside is not your substance. It's just... It's only a light and a, and a, and a, and a, and a uh, ray. In comparison to Hashem's very self. So like we say, now this idea that the creations are deriving their existence only from a ray and not from anything substantial is from another verse as well. In addition to Malchus Cha Malchus There's another pasuk. Hoid also in Pesukah de Zimra, also in the verses of songs we say in the morning. Hoid el Eretz Only His glory, Hoid means His glory. Glory is not Him, His glory is upon the heaven and the earth. She'edetz v'shamayim, earth and heaven. Eino yalo ho'idoi v'ziv v'ziv v'ayi only a light and a ray. Shubchenes malchusa yizbarach, which is only his kingship. Hamachah yamahava oisam, that enlivens them and, 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 and brings them into being me'ayin le'yesh. From nothing to something, li'yas nivroyim nifradim. To be what? This ray. Since the ray is all about the outside. Since kingship is all about what? What's kingship? All about being a king on someone who's not you. So therefore the worlds that are deriving from kingship become and experience themselves as beings with, with, with a desire of their own, not God's desire. Nifradim, 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 separate beings. And in that separateness, if you're separate from God, then obviously only God is infinite. So if you're separate from God, then what? Then you are a limited being. So balei gvul, the limited entities. And therefore, they are pathetically insignificant. And they have zero meaning. Now, once they're finite, compared to an infinite source, an infinite being, they have nothing. Who compared to the Orin Sof Hamizgal? Now, on a higher, higher dimension, almost like we could say beyond creation, there is also worlds, but those worlds are one with God. Beyond creation, there are worlds, but those worlds are not creations. That's why they're called beyond creation. Over there, the Oirin Seif is revealed. Oh, wow. So they experience infinity. And in those realms, there's infinite pleasure and infinite delight and infinite truth and bliss and ecstasy that is endless because it's all part of the Ein Sof. But then there is this disconnect that happens because of Malchus, because of kingship, that creates an outside. And that outside creates a construct of finitude. And everybody living in that lives as finite beings. And as a result of that is severely, severely compromised. So much so, as we said, that there's no comparison. As he says, that reveals itself in the supernal worlds. When we say supernal worlds over here, we mean primarily Atsilus. Atsilus and what's beyond Atsilus. Which over there in that dimension and that level is Ein Sof, literally Ein Sof. Why? Because there, there can be the infinite because there's, there's only one being who's infinite, that's Hashem, and they're just Him. They're just lost in Him. There, everything is unified, and everything is in a state of absolute bitl. As it says about the spheroids of Atsilos. What does it say about the spheroids, the attributes of Atsilos? 
L'cha Hashem ha to you great is greatness, which means even though there is, gedula represents chesed, even though there is an entity called kindness, but the kindness doesn't, doesn't feel itself with a consciousness of its own, the kindness is God's kindness and it's nullified to him. It doesn't even feel its kindness because it's nullified to the source of kindness. And we say also, l'cha, the, the emphasis of l'cha to you, nullified to you. They don't, they're not even self-aware. They're so lost in the Ein Sof. She'af she'yesham gam kem chenes gedula gevura. So there are really what we, what we might say is the, 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 uh, the, the, the bricks, the, uh, the, the uh, not the bricks, the material, the, 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 the source of, time, of space. You have already the six directions. You have gedula gevura. But because they're so unified with source, they're not limited. Which are the supernal midot, the supernal attributes of the world of Atzilus. Chesed, the gevura, kindness and gevura, and severity, the But they are in a state of absolute unity and oneness. L'cha Hashem, they are nullified to you. And, and that's why in the world of Atzilus, what do we say? That both the lights... And, and the vessels are not yet separate. And that's what's called in Zohar, chiyuhu, which means his, his life forces. Garmu means his garments or his vessels. They're not separated from him. Shehem chenes oirez v'keilem da'atzilos, which are the lights and the vessels of atzilos. Chad bohin mamish, he's literally one with them. B'chenes ein soif mamish, in a state of ein soif. And says, and there's not of any of these midas. Then Hashem, Hashem is not, and since the midas are unified with Him, so the midas are not finite. You see what I'm saying? They're not defined, they're not specified, they're not separated. Which isn't the case once we drop past that silos. We take the infinite plunge, and where do we fall into a big black hole? That's what it really is, the black hole. It sucks one in to a state of separateness. And once you're separate, then, then you're just a little crumb. Bibia, and you're in the world of Bria, Yetzir, and Asiya. So, so there too in that black hole, the, the divine energy is also, that's creating that, there's also divinity there that extends into that hole. But, it's very contracted and very hidden. And therefore, it's the ain't sof of it, the godliness of it is not sensed over there. Because they are limited beings. And separate creations. And these contractions that diminish and lessen the light increase as we go further and further away and lower into creation. And as it continues evolving, and it descends lower and lower, until we come to the world of Asiya, the world of the physical, the world of the material, the world of what we call creation is completed. The divine energy is completely concealed. To the point that we don't feel energy at all. We feel just, we feel just what? Clumps, clumps, clumpy, chunkies, chunks of stuff. Until it just appears that there's stuff. Look in the room over here. Does it look like this ain't self or does it look like this stuff? If you're seeing ain't self, you're probably. Where I need you to be. Um, in any case, but how do we look at the worlds? The world seems to be like just separate entities. Which gives rise to the minim, to the apostates, to say that there's two, there, there's two, two dominions, two powers. The Gemara says in Masech the Sanhedrin, Sha'amad Amin, there was an Amin, a, a heretic, who said to, what's his name, I think Amemar, he said to him, Mi Palgoch, now this guy was a, he was a magician. That's what Rashi says. 
So he said to him, Mipal goch li'ilo'i, from your half and upward, your upper half, dormiz, according to Rashi and Tosfus have an argument what that means. The Rebbe over here, the Alter Rebbe exp- seems to be following Tosfus's explanation. Dormiz means belongs to God. Horm is from the word chen. Chen means grace. It belongs to the graceful one, which is God. Your upper half. He, said, I, I, he says, I got a sense of you. He says, your upper half belongs to God. Your lower half, the ahormiz, belongs to ahormiz, which is the name of a demon. In other words, half of you is a being of light, connected to source, and the other half is a being of darkness. That's what he said to him. And then he answered him, well, if it's two domains, he said to him, if my body is really of two domains, how come the upper domain allows passageway through it to the lower domain? Because usually if, you know, there's border control, especially in, in Trump's America, you know, create, create the wall, creating a separation. So you can't just pass. What's, what's going on over here? Meaning, if it's two separate domains, how come they pass on? Meaning, everything we eat ends up going out from the lower half. So how come it lets it go through? That's what he answered him. So what's, what's, what's going on over here? When he says the lower half and the higher half, was he, he perceived a schism in creation, a break in creation. He understood, this, this apostate understood, that in the, there is a higher dimension of existence where, there is, where it's... Where there, where there truly is, God runs the show. And there's only oneness. But there is another domain. There is a cutoff. A, at a certain point, the creation gets its own identity and governs itself. To the point where we can govern our own lives. And basically what he was trying to say is that we can do our... That there is, there is a spiritual realm. We agree that there is some. You can go to a, a tall mountain in the Himalayas and touch that place. When you come down to live ordinary lives in this world, this world has complete different rules. Because it's governed not by the singular being, which is God, it's governed by the demonics, the, the world of separateness. And therefore, over here, you better go get yourself a big ego and fight for yourself, for your survival, for your importance, for your existence. That's the idea. That's what he said. That's what life is. He saw it. Yeah, but that's why is that way? In other words, he's basically saying you're half human, you're half a refined human being. You're, you're of course, you're an animal. Yeah, but that itself is that that itself is an indication that there is a higher place where there is a higher truth, and there is a lower place that's governed by other things. And, that, and he was trying to say it's governed. It's you can't make peace between these higher two realms. And, yeah, and ultimately, they determined to mean the unholy. And in the cosmos, it also exists, the upper and the lower. And he was touching upon something. It's not that he's wrong. You see, the Alter Rebbe was saying this apostate was not, was not wrong. He was right. But he was wrong. He was right because he was looking at things as they are from the perspective and the experience of the initial form of the way God created it. Shem created it that the lower worlds become separated in their consciousness, in their... But that's where the Jew comes along to bridge these two worlds and make the lower half be as godly conscious as the upper half. Because it's the world of separation. Like it, and, and, and it's hinted to, right at the story of creation, you have Hashem telling you where this separation comes from. As it says, Venar, Eden. Eden is the first point. Aden is the point of pleasure, but Aden is the point where existence emerges. From where? From, from God. So that's like the super powerful Ein Sof. From there comes, but from there the creation, creation can't be sustained by Aden because then we would have no, we would be sucked up in God's truth completely. There would be nothing to us, only the infinite. So Aden has to be like the power that empowers but from Aden comes, Aden is the point of Chachma, the first point of energy. Then from there, there needs to be an Aspashtus. What's the Aspashtus? A river, a life flow 
departs from Eden. It yotes it, goes away from Eden. Therefore, it's not in that intense truth of Eden, of overwhelming emes of a look of, of Einod, Movado. No, it's a river that moves out. And it goes through, and then it goes through various, and the river travels. But it's still connected, it's still only oneness, even when the river. But it reaches a point of Misham Yipare, that goes into the Gan, into the, into the garden, and then after the garden, what happens to the river? It forks into four rivers. And what that really means, the word that the, 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 the Pasuk uses, Yipare, Yipare, the Hasidus says, means from the word Alma de Pruda, there's already begin separation. So according to the deeper meaning that happens in the end of Atsilos, as we transition from Atsilos to Bria, we're, 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 we're dropping into the world of disconnect, separate. The Achtos, the one being that permeates everything, and therefore there should only be one drive, one desire, one being, is not felt anymore. Even though above where the river is, where Aden is, and where the river that flows from Aden is, all the way to the Gan, that whole long uh, run of the river. It's all unified perfectly. The Oirin Saif Meir Sham and the Oirin Saif illuminates there. In a revealed way, Im Kozen, nevertheless, Misham Yiparet, from there it separates. Once it passes through the filter, the screen of Malchus, what happens, it continues, it passes through with many, many contractions and concealments, to obscure and to hide the light, the light of Hashem, till the creations don't feel themselves just as a continuum of Hashem, but rather as if they're new entities that didn't exist, that are not, they're new entities, and have a limit, and they're living in worlds that are separated. And therefore, anything that's below this yiparid, anything that's in that lower half, is not at all, doesn't have, is in. So the Rebbe is saying something else. In addition to them being separate and therefore ignorant, so to speak, but that, that literally also translates into another chisara, in another, um, and another deficiency that the, that the separate entity has. Once you're separate, you're, you, number one, that's a lie, because you're not really separated. Okay, but then as much as you feel separated, you're disconnected from the source. If you disconnect from the source, then you're finite. Because you have you have an energy creating you, but you are but you are you and your experience is not God. If you're melted with everything else in the oneness, then you're part of His one and your own self. But that's not because of you; that's because of Him. Once you disconnect and become something, then you're you're only something. You're only what you are. I give a simple example. If my fingers cease to realize that they're a finger of my body. And they literally they don't have the consciousness of my body, and they have their own consciousness. And I can't control my finger at all. The finger just decides to do whatever it wants. Un, can, not communicating with my greater brain, then who is lacking? The finger thinks it's gaining because, ah, no, but it becomes now tiny, small, because now it's only a finger and it has no greater body to be part of. And therefore, it's not human anymore. It's just a slab of meat that does meat and bone that will be a finger without much content, whatever, but it becomes tiny in that, in that. Uh, so therefore, what we're saying over here is once the creations are therefore balegvul v'tachlas, separate because of their, so now, co now compared to the Ain Sof, they're what? Equal zero. Because to an infinite being, no matter how big of a macher you are, no matter how, you're still zero. Because to the infinite, any finite level, no matter how great your boundaries are, no matter how expansive you are, you're still infinitely far from the infinite. And if you're infinitely far from the infinite means just like 
a grain of sand is infinitely insignificant. One grain of sand is infinitely insignificant to the infinite. Planet Mars or the galaxy or for in that case the entire universe if it has an end is also insignificant to the ends of. And not just also insignificant, just as, as insignificant as a kernel of sand. As a grain of sand. As he says over here, a nebedach klal doesn't have any value at all. To the light of God, that is revealed and shining in the upper worlds. Because over there the experience is ain't self. As it is known, when in the realm of numbers, and in numbers, one compared to no, myriads, of, millions of, millions and billions. One has significance. Why is one significant? Because the way to become a billionaire is to start with one dollar. And then you double it to two, then you double it to four. Eventually, it might take you a while, but you get there. But if you don't have one, then you never get. So one has, and if you add one, you're a little bit closer. Yeah. The reason is because the billion or the trillion is also made up of numbers. But something that is limited, no matter how great and awesome it is. Legabe beligavul when it's when it is compared and evaluated to a beligavul to an infinite entity. Pepchenas ain't so if ain loy erech legamri has zero, is utterly meaningless. Or mispar echad or mispar riva idevavin shava mamish, and one and a trillion are equal. And to put into simple terms, if I was told that I have to go on an infinite journey. So I, obviously when I start the journey, how far am I from my destiny? When I get to milepost a trillion, can I relax and say, oh, almost there? No, because how far do I have to go? Infinite. I haven't shortened my distance at all. Because the infinite I will never get to with finite steps and with finite miles. Or that. It's that. That was so therefore, one and a trillion is absolutely the same. And, and therefore, because the, the finite worlds are finite, and therefore not completely insignificant to the Ein Sof, that's the reason why their, their life force is not Ein Sof. Their life force is only a ray of the Ein Sof. Only a array of him. And that relates to this, to this type of existence. God himself, from his true essence, can't, not can't relate. It's, 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 it's utterly meaningless to him. And therefore, it's not a sustaining power for this, for this kind of creation. For, this kind. for Ein Sof, yeah. But for what's not Ein Sof, no. Array is Shaykh to the creation. Okay, but this is not the plan. This is the way the worlds are initially created. Uh, with this disconnect. Okay. But this was the plan of creation that the Abishtu wanted, that the Orin Sof should be revealed, should be present, but not only present, revealed. In the lower worlds. And how much so? Not a little bit. But it should be revealed in the same way like he is revealed in the upper worlds. Which this is the epitome and the ultimate purpose. From the creation of the worlds. That Hashem should have a home in this world. A home means, what is a home? A home is not a place where you shine your light in or your rays or your ideas are, pre are prevalent in the home. The home is a place where you yourself live there. You, as much as you are you. So we, God wants to have a home in this world. Not, not only his rays, but he himself should be. And a home is also a place 
where not only you're there, but you're there and the place responds to your being there. That means you're there in a revealed way. So having a home in this world means that the worlds are conscious of the fact that God himself is living in. So for that to happen, so that's why Hashem planted into this, into this non-existence world, Hashem planted some of His substance. Luminous, luminance, luminance, lights were planted from above. And who was those lights? These are the souls of Israel. Who they descend and come down and enclose themselves. All of the, the secret over here is enclosing. They become part of the world, become invested in the body. So much so that we don't, when, we, when we're alive, we can't differentiate, okay, now I'm going to rise to my soul, now I'm going to go down to my body. And they become one. That's just one consciousness, one entity. Boss of dumb flesh and blood. That shows how deeply part of the creation the Nishama becomes. But what is it really? It's a, it's a point of light of Hashem's, of the Orin Sof. And what is it going to do? Bichdei Shayadei Torah, it is when it will start behaving like a godly being. How will it start behaving like a godly being? When it will think the thoughts that God thinks, say the words that God speaks, and do the things that God does, then it will start revealing its inherent godliness in this world. Shayadei Torah, mitzvah smaisis, through the Torah and the practical mitzvahs, that we do in this world, Yamshichu, they should drink, draw down Khinas Gili or Insaf, Baruchu, the revelation of the Ain Sof. Lamata down here, but Oilam Satahtainim in the lower worlds, Gamkin. Kumashu Boilam Sal Yainim. Equally the way he is in the higher worlds, meaning equally as he is manifest in Atsilus and beyond. And then the higher and the lower worlds will be synchronized, will be unified. Meaning the same revelation that's up there will be down here. It won't be any more half, a half malach and a half galach. It won't be any more half, half holy, half mundane, half godly, aware. It won't be that way. There won't be any more separate worlds. And there won't be any more concealment of God's continents. As it says in the Pasuk, your teacher will not hide from you anymore. Your master will not hide. Now he is hidden. Oh boy, is he coming. Oh boy, is he coming strong. Oh boy, is he coming soon, 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 very soon. Boom. We should make a song of that. And this is the meaning of Zerea Tzedakos. It says, God plants tzedakah. So tzedakah is called planting. And what's going to, and, and, but, but when you plant something, you're hoping to what? To get a harvest, to get something growing. Matzmiach Yeshua, he makes sprout forth from the planting salvations. Yeshua means salvations. Pidish, what does that mean? It's too, you know, it's, it's not so clear openly in the mimer, but that's what comes out. There's two plantings going on here. Number one is that the Abishta plants an Ishamma in the world. That's the planting number one. The soul, which is a, from outside of this creation, from the worlds of total unity with God, this Nisham is plucked from its source and, and, pl and, and plummets into the lowest, lowest, buried in the earth because it, it comes into the lowest form of creation, in the lowest existence, most, most disconnected. That's one planting. Planting number two, the mitzvahs that are also inherently of the Ein Sof, they're very high, get also transported into physical actions. A mitzvah is not really, a, in, in its core essence, it's the will and the wisdom of the Creator, which is infinite in Ein Sof. But they get packaged, so to speak, in a keli, in, the, in, the material, in a material action. So that's another planting. And when we plant the mitzvah, what happens? The product, godly revelation. That's the meaning, matzmiach, we grow forth, Yeshua is the salvation. So why does it say tzedakah? It should say zareya mitzvah. Why does it say tzedakah? Because the tzedakah is the prototype of all the mitzvahs. In this idea that we're talking about now, 
Tzedakah exemplifies what all mitzvahs really are. Because what is the idea of tzedakah? The idea of tzedakah is that you're giving to a place that's very, very lacking. You give tzedakah to a poor, destitute person. Now, if you think about it, the poor, destitute person, if you don't feed him and don't take care of him, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom will die. He's in a state of lacking life, lacking a means to live. So it's a, it's a very low, dark, chas v'shalom, almost place of death. The sages say a poor man is compared to a dead person. It's really sad. It's, it's a place of death. It's lacking life. What are you doing? You're giving tzedakah because you're filling that, that vacuum of life, that empty space of life. You're filling it with life. You're giving him a sandwich. And because he ate that sandwich, he can carry on another two days. And, and live. So you're giving life to a place that's lacking life. Now real life is the infinite. This, all the, all the worlds and everything that's in it, as vast and as magnificent and unbelievable, terrific it looks to us, but from the ultimate perspective of thing, it's a little black hole lacking life. It's a place of destitute, it's a place of death, it's a place of darkness. Because Ain Sof is not revealed over there. And when you do, and when you, and when you're doing a mitzvah, Tzedakah, when you're giving tzedakah, and really every mitzvah, you're dropping life into that lifeless zone. Because you're dropping a, a seed of the Ein Sof there, and it will reveal itself. Life will reveal itself there. Matzmiach, when it will grow. So that's why it says, tzedakah, even though it's really all mitzvahs, but tzedakah is... In this idea of zriya, zriya means to plant in order to produce. So you're planting because you're planting into that dark space. You're planting and it will grow life. Just through tzedakah that you're giving below to a poor man, the less lay megar meklum who has nothing of his own. And you are being influencing to a place of darkness. Like it says, oh, you see, I was kekois charavos. I wanted to get it, to look that up in Tehillim, what that means. Does that mean an empty cup? Or does that mean kois is a type of bird? Kois and yanchuf. I think kois charavos means, a, is referring to the, we say it. I'll say it in Tehillim, but I, let me see. Tell you right now. What? Let me go over here. We're going to ask Rabbi Google. Are ye? I think it's spelled by ye. Tehillim, Kuv Beis. Okay. Give me a second. Oh. There you go, Rashi. Shem Oif, I was right. Kois Charovis is the name of a bird. It's a Kois Veser Shalach. Charovis Midbarois. It's like a bird of the of the of the desert. 
So in that sense, meaning we're, we're, we're desolate. We don't have a place where we're lost. I don't know why from all, from all, from all psukim, and he wants to emphasize this, why is he bringing in kais haravis for this emptiness? I'm a poor man. I'm, he's, he's giving the mashal of a poor. Why is he, why is that? Maybe there's another piddush of kais haravis, which means an empty cup. I don't know what the Mitsuda says. I mean, you know what, let me check if the Mitsuda says another Piddush. Um, I have it here, so I might as well, I might as well check. Yeah, everybody's translating it as a, as a bird. It makes sense because it says it next to the other word, the Chkois Chadovois, Lika'as Midbar, which is, a, again, as a bird. Um, I guess it's a very, it's a very, it's a bird that's very needy. Yeah, but, 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 but. Chorev, dried, I don't know. In any case. Cherev means, Cherev means it's like in the, in the heated when it's in the, in the midst of the summer when it's dry. And in any case, in Ayadei Zeth through this Ma'oyde Demel Ma'ayla Gamkein, through this we evoke above as well. I'm Shachas Eirin Saif Baruch Lamata. The drawing forth of the infinite light, Ba'oyla Mesatach Tainim in the lower worlds. Shehem Choyshech, which the lower worlds are considered darkness, Va'almen de Pruda and worlds of separation. Vizau, and this is the meaning of matz. What, what's the result of zarei tzedakos by planting the tzedakah? Ma, again, so the zarei tzedakah has two parts. Hashem plants us so that we can give tzedakah while we're down here, and we're planting in mitzvahs, in the physical mitzvahs, and the, the sprouting that's going to sprout from that is what tzmiach Yeshua Yeshu pchenes tzmicha betoisefes veriboy. This is the sprouting forth with added and increased liyasam shacha. Now he's going to play the word Yeshua. Yeshua comes from the word, the root of it is shin ayin hei. Which shin ayin hei, sha'a, we'll soon see it has related to the word sha'a, but also shin ayin hei is a, alluding to the revelation of the Ein Sof. Because in, what's the revelation of the Ein Sof? The revelation of Keser. Keser is Ein Sof. Especially Pneumius are Keser. It's Ein Sof, Shebe Ein Sof. And on that level, it speaks about in Kabbalah that there is the idea of Shin Ayin Nohorin, the 370 lights. What's the significance of the number 370? 300 is related to the letter Shin. Shin, it's three Moichin of Atik, the three higher Moichin, Keser Chachme and Bina of Atik Yomin. And the ayin, the 70, is Zion Taton, the seven lower spheroids of Atik Yomen. But basically this means, what's Atik Yomen, the ancient of days? This is the Eberster himself, the Ein Sof himself. So when, when we're doing Torah Mitzvahs, we're drawing Shin Ayin Oiren, we're drawing the, from the highest of the high. Now by the way, Shin Ayin, the Tzemach Tzedek, as I saw, so is interesting. It's even deeper than when we say we, we should make a hundred brachas every day. We make a hundred brachas every day by saying blessings, we draw God down into the world. And where do we know that? It says in the Pasuk, Noum HaGever, behold the man. Who instituted it? David HaMelech. Noum HaGever. Who come all? He, 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 he established the yoke. And the yoke is the awareness of God comes from saying brachas all the time. Now all is ayin lamid. So it's the same, same idea. Because lamid is three, just like shin is three. So lamid represents the three mochin. And ayin, same ayin, the seven lower. But he says the difference between sh, shin ayin nahorin and ayin lamid is the shin is on a higher level than the lamid. Because the lamid is only double digits three. Lamid is 30. Shin is triple digits she. Uh, three, so it's indicating a much deeper level within this within the source, and that's what's being nimshach as a result of zarei atzedakos to our physical mitzvahs that we do. We're drawing down the shin ayin ahorin, 
Ilan lamati below. Ukemoisha bitzdaka. And that's life. Again, the destitute. You're giving tzedakah. You're giving a poor man a food. He's in a place of darkness, lack. Ukemoisha bitzdaka kol pruto pruto mitzdarefes lachesh ben gadol. But the main idea of the maimer is, it's not like we, every neshama comes down and plants one thing and runs away. The point over here is the continuous doing of mitzvahs. It's the repetition. It's the multiplicity of the action. And that's why the neshama is greater than a halacha, as we're soon going to see. The halacha is a fixed halacha, it's there. Anybody that comes around and learns that halacha, good. But like this, it's one thing, it can't produce anything else. A neshama can do and repeat mitzvahs, and can do many mitzvahs, and can create children who they will have mitzvahs. So a neshama is a limitless expression of the ain't self in this world. We're going to get to that. But... But that's why he's emphasizing over here, it's not just the one tzedakah that you're doing, it's the constant actions of tzedakah. That what? The komoisha b'tzedakah, kol prutum pruta. When you're giving tzedakah, every little bit you do, you get a big cheshba. Today's days we have it with all the social media uh, charity campaigns. Why are they so powerful? They're so powerful is because they are eliciting or is that the word? It's, it's stimulating the, the small donors. People that will give $10, $18, $3,600. Used to be, if you're an organization, you're looking for money, you go visit the big, the big, the big, the big machers to get big money. But there's a ways, because everybody wants to give to Dhaka. People, they can't give the huge, big amounts, but they can give. So the times that I, I was trying to raise money for uh, whatever, even just last week, I sent out a thing to try to raise small amounts but it turned into an enormous contribution you know you can you can able to give to someone for their wedding it's like from from what from the, the fact that and that's the power of these 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 things you can send one message with one push you reach a few hundred people bang so it becomes a chesh bin gadol even though each one is small and that's the idea all the mitzvahs that jews do across the world it's going to turn in the end into a chesh bin gadol, into a singular powerful revelation that is going to blow the finitude out of the finite world and include it into the Ein, into the Ein Sof. The Dira B'tachtonim, Hashem Himself to be down here. Chesh bin gadol shenas mazebchen is gilu Ein Sof shenikra chesh bin gadol, that's the call, the real gadol, the infinite. That's one meaning of the word Yeshua is that we're bringing little tidbits of this light. The Gam Yeshua is, but the word Yeshua has another meaning. Umaloshin Sha'a is Gavaldic. The word Yeshua also, the root of the word is from the word. Till now we work, we work the Gamatria. Now he's going to work the actual translation of the word. Yeshua, besides salvation, also means Sha'a, which means to turn. Where do we find that word? It says, Kamashakasava Yisha Hashem al Hevel, Hashem turned to Hevel, Velman Chasai, and to his gift. Well, Kain Velman Chasai, but to Cain and his Mincha, Loisha Hashem did not turn. What does that mean? Turning of God to someone means the revelation of Hashem Himself. As opposed to his rays. Malchus is Hashem not turning. Malchus is his, his, his illuminations, his lights. He himself turning means it's his very self. Like the famous story of the Tzemach Tzedek. And when the Tzemach Tzedek was a little boy, a little, you know, his, I, I mentioned earlier in the class that his mother passed away. With him. So she asked the Alter Rebbe to, to raise him. So the Alter Rebbe himself raised him. She so was a little boy maybe, you know, he was playing, three years old, whatever, he was playing, and his grandfather held him on his lap. And his grandfather asked him, Via de Zayda, where is the Zayda? And the Alter Rebbe said to him, Is das the Zayda? He says, Nein, das is the cup for the Zayda. The Alter Rebbe said, Das the Zayda? He said, Nein, das is the oyer, this is the ears of the Zayda. This is the oigen, this is the eyes of the Zayda. And I said, That's the nose for the Zayda. And now, okay. He said, Via de Zayda. Samar Sadik went off to play. And whether he pretended or he actually hurt himself, I'm not a, I guess I, I heard the story two ways. And he cry shrieked, and the Alter Rebbe jumped up, Semach said it. And Semach said, Oh, Dodd is it. 
This is not this or that. This is you in your entirety. He was able to see. This is you and your entirety. Because when you turn, when you hear a child, you know, your grandson got hurt or whatever, you turn with your entire being. And that's what we mean over here. The Abish that turned to Hevel with his entire being. That's what we want to draw into the world. To Kayanat and to Hevel, yeah. We'll soon see. The, this is the, the only mimer I've seen where he, act, he always brings this Pasuk in tons of mimer. But the only place where, where he actually connects it to Kayan and Hevel. Why to Hevel, yeah, and to Kayan, no. We'll see in a minute. This idea of turning is the descent of the drawing down of the Ein Soif Lamata through physical mitzvahs. The Jewish people do down here below. We talk on the top of the second column. That's why all mitzvahs are called tzitzit. It's revealed in the Torah, not as they are revealed in Rambam or whatever, the counting of mitzvahs, but as they're revealed in the order of Chumash, what's the first commandment? Be fruitful and multiply. Because that's what mitzvahs are all about. Every mitzvah is about being fruitful and multiplying, multiplying godliness in this world. Well, mitzvahs periyavirivya is the mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying. It means to add. It reminds me of the story, you should have it for Shalem and Aftali Astulin. Aftali Astulin was on the plane. You know the story? He once said it here. It's so, so good. He was sitting next to a, uh, a priest. And the priest started up with him. He wanted to, uh, he wanted to, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, not illuminate him. What was that word I was looking for? He wanted to uh, enlighten him. Anyways, he got picked the wrong fella. Naftali Astulin starts telling him, you know, what's the first commandment in the Torah? He says, you have to produce. He says, you have to produce. He says, he says, you know, everybody in the world produces. The God, the kingdom, Hashem has this and this and this. He says, but what are you producing? You're producing nothing. <laughs> it's funny. Just you produce, have children, create more servants for the king, more servants, more. And it's an empire. This is what do they call it? This celibacy or whatever. You're not. You're not producing nothing. If the types are garnished, you know. The least of any significant being in this world is, 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 is to be the priest. In that sense. Kamoi, can I, they call, a mitzvah ma'isi, he's through all the physical, all the mitzvah ma'isi, sha'oisim Yisrael, that you didn't do. Nasim ribuy v'taisefes. We do a ribuy and an addition. V'zao ben poires Yosef. Yosef is here to be pores. Pores means to increase. Yosef represents all this neshamas that are planted down here. Yosef is that quintessential neshama whose business is channeling light down into this world. Because there's another job in neshamas, by the way. There's another job in neshamas which he's not discussing in this minor, which is the job of being refining the gashmias, polishing. This minor is not talking about polishing. This mimer is focused on downloading. There's two things. This creating the vessel. So in that sense, Yosef is the ultimate downloader of godliness from above down. And therefore, Yosef, and that's why Ben Pores. Yosef, what's his job? Ben Pores. He's a cha, he's, 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 Pores means to increase. To add more light. Yosef, what's, why is Yosef called Yosef? Al Shem Vahoya Bayoima, who will be on that day? Yosef Hashem Shainis Yah. Hashem will ink, will again stretch out his hand, which means referring to the ultimate revelation that's going to be in the end. That's the Yosef. That's the Hisafa that came about through all the Yosefs from the beginning of time until the end. Is that they all were working towards the ultimate Hisafa, the ultimate increasement of God's light in this world. That's going to be when Mashiach comes. We go sif base, peric base. This is going to go really quickly. This is the kavan of the bracha that when we, 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 we make a blessing before the doing of all mitzvahs. Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you, God. Asher Kiddishonu b'mitzvah, so you are sanctified us with your mitzvahs. Finish, what is the meaning? Asher, they say, when you're doing a mitzvah, when you're doing a mitzvah, you are downloading infinite pleasure. Because if by doing a mitzvah you're revealing the ain't sof in this world, what did he say earlier in the Mimer? 
What did he say? That as long as we're in the black hole, in finite, limited existence, even pleasure is very, very silly. Because the whole existence is a silly existence, an utterly insignificant existence. When you open the world up to the Ein Sov, you increase its, its experience, and especially on the realm of pleasure, to an Ein Sov pleasure, to an infinite pleasure. And that's what we say every time we make a bracha. Baruch atah, when we make a mitzvah, Asher Kiddishanu, the Asher is a very important word. When you're saying a blessing, you would think that that's the least of significance in the word. You know, like when I write a title, I didn't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I never went to school to learn writing, so I never really knew all these things, but I got my daughters taught me, this one taught me, that when you, when you put in, so titles should all be capitalized. Besides, if you're writing the, then, you know, these are not important words, so these are not capital. Everything else, it's a title, it's a t- capital word. So in in Asher Kedishon, like what's the what 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 word is the is like the insignificant word? Baruch blessed. Wow, Atas God, Hashem God, Elokeinu, Melech Haolam, the King of the World. Kedishon made us holy. Bimitzvos of His mitzvah. Vitzivano commanded us. Laniach tefillin to do it. These every every single word is important. The only word that seems to me the most insignificant word, it's only there to like attach, is the word asher. Asher, that. Asher Kedishan. In Hasidus, the asher is like the highest in the whole bracha. That's what I love about it. It's always like unexpected. It's always like what you think is like da, da, da. Why? Asher comes from the word this week's parasha, asher. Who was born? Asher. One of the, one of the children. And when she said, ah, she said, everybody will praise me. Asher is praise which represents the idea of praise and delight and pleasure. This is the ecstasy and bliss that is revealed in the world where Mashiach will come as a result of those points of Ein Sof that came into the world through the mitzvahs. In my fortune, because my, the, the uh, girls will, will praise me. This is the supernal delight, which is in a level of Ein Sof. Acha Amar Azal, that it's it's such a worthy pleasure, it's such an it's such an otherworldly pleasure that we will experience in this world. But Chazal said Gabe Acher, they said regarding the the sage that we don't name him by his name because he, he had such a mess up. Um, it says about him that Mutiv de Ladaine Vale Salah the Yasi. The sages decided that it's better to put him through the worst punishments, and we're talking terrible punishments. He was in Gehenna for over a hundred years, longer even. And usually a soul is only in Gehenna for a year, maximum. He was in Gehenna for over a hundred more, maybe 150 years, very long period of time. And the sages could have prevented him from going to Gehenna. But they decided to let him suffer because they said it's worth it to let him suffer till he should come to this infinite pleasure. And we know that and, and it's, not na- it's not worth it if pleasure is any, if, if the pleasure of the future of the world of the mitzvahs is in any way re- relatable to our pleasure, we know that we would never submit ourselves to being tortured, even for a very short period of time. Even if you promise people, promise a person serious pleasure, the pleasure is just not worth the pain. If it's serious pain, submit yourself to a, to go for, go into a torture dungeon for uh, three hours a torture session, and then after that you'll get a, a million dollars? I wouldn't do it. Most people wouldn't do it, I think. Oh, I told him a sugar, yeah. But talking about, yeah, but talking about over here, uh, a, 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 a hundred and of the ple- of, you know, of Gehenna, it must be that if the sages said it's worth it, it's because it's a different kind of a pleasure that it is worth even such suffering. And that pleasure comes down here, al yadei asiyas mitzvah through doing the mitzvah. Oh, but hear this. Why did Hashem turn to Hevel? And Hashem did not turn to Cain. Cain was also turning to God, Cain. And the answer is because when you plant a seed in the earth, Agashmi, in the physical earth, you can put seeds in the earth from today till tomorrow, but it has to be fertile soil for it to grow. And how does it become fertile soil? by crushing the soil. Only when you crush the soil and you break it down from its, from its 
density and thickness, and you soften it, and then you plant, then it will grow. But if you take seeds and you put them into just plain soil without any preparing that soil, it's a waste of the seed. You're decomposing the seed, or maybe it won't even decompose, but whatever, and it won't, you're not going to gain anything. You first have to plow the earth hative. But they let it up, he says, to loosen the soil. Because plowing marpi ara softens the soil. And if not, you're going to lose the seed. You're just going to lose it in the earth. Before the, the soul start planting mitzvahs, what, what is the planting? Every mitzvah is planting a seed. Well, we're fulfilling all the, all the positive mitzvahs. We first have to do We first need to depart from bad. We first have to soften the ego. That false sense of pirud, of separation, which is engulfs the human being, and if we don't take our animal soul to task and break him down by not giving him whatever he wants, then he's not, then even though you do your mitzvah with your body, it won't produce, the, it won't release the Ein Sof because the body is too dense and thick and blocking. So how do you talk to break it? You break it by breaking the ego. And how do you break the ego? By telling yourself no. And how do you say no? By listening to all the prohibitive commandments. When you obey the prohibited commandments, which are mostly things that you would like to do, but you don't do because Torah says you can't do it, that's a crush. That's another bang on the soil. And it, it softens the soil to make it powdery. And then when you do a mitzvah, psh, that's why you have to have sur merat, departing from bad. Not so much just because separating from the bad stuff. It's because you have to say to yourself, no, 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 just that false sense of I am, which contradicts the unity of God, that there's only one I. The fact that we're constantly promoting, the body promotes the, the I, I am and I want, that is, has to be told no, 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 till it becomes diminished and softened, and then you can put it. A person has to convert all the negative midos. You have to suspend all the desires that are not for God. You shouldn't have any other desire but the will of Hashem, for Hashem. But if a person is full of himself, then he won't be able to fulfill. Have a broken heart. Have a broken heart and a crushed heart from feeling so inadequate in this, in this project. And only then, then when you're doing good, you're able to draw the revelation of the Ein Sof down here, which is that this growth with an addition that happens through the planting. In the physical mitzvah, that we do below. And this is the reason that Elkein, Vel Mincha, said to Kayan and to his Mincha, Loi Shah, Hashem did not turn. Bipnei was lacking in this, what's the point, Hashem is not going to turn to him, he has nowhere to grow, there was nowhere to take, Hashem had nowhere to, the plant had nowhere to kind of take effect. Bipnei Shekayin oyamore de Rugzin, because Kayin was an angry person, he was full of his anger and rage and jealousy and envy, he hasn't yet submitted himself and broke his ego. Shaloi hoye bipchena surmerai did not depart from his over, overinflated self, to convert the negative midos, which is the plowing that is necessary. And therefore, it wasn't in his ability to draw down the light of God, because God can only reveal Himself where there is where there is bittel, and there is no bittel over here. Through his planting, through his mincha, which isn't the case of hevel. Hevel is the one who turns away from Rabbit. Maybe it's hinted to in his name, Hevel. Havel Havalam Hakal Shlomo. He sees that everything is foolish other than Omar Shlomo. Anything besides God, anything besides torment is foolish. That's what, maybe, it doesn't say it here. Betachlis Ksivbe, by him it says, Vayisha Hashem El Hevel. Hashem turned to Hevel, Vel Menchasa, and to his Mincha. Shubchenes Azriya Shaloi, which is his planting. His planting that he did, the Abish to turn to. And this is, and here's the thing. But how long, when do we have to do this? Here the amazing thing, I, this, the next piece got, got me very happy. Because how long are we going to have to plow 
the land in order to produce through our mitzvahs ain't self. As long as the the body and the human condition is one that is 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 dense and and filled with self. But once Mashiach will come and God's light will fill everywhere, so automatically the body will be humbled. The human being will be humbled and we won't have even an ego to crush. So then immediately when you do a mitzvah, you will have the full revelation of the angel without the plowing. And that's the reason why it says, and regarding the future, it says, Bechadish of plowing ubekatsir and of harvesting tishbois, tishbois, you will rest. You will rest from plowing. What does that mean? You won't need any more plowing. Because it says, Hashem is going to remove the spirit of impurity from the earth. And therefore, there's not, you, don't have to, you don't have to break the klippa because there's no klippa there. Hashem will remove it. And therefore, ain't so. so here in the mimer over here, it seems to be saying that only the plowing you don't have to do, but the sowing is still going to continue. The mitzvahs were still going to continue. But the, the, the Mittler Rebbe, in his version of the Mimer, says that the Pasuk says, Bechadish u Bakatsir Tishbois. Even from the Katsir, you're going to be able to stop, rest. Because you don't even need the mitzvahs to reveal God, because God is evidently revealed already everywhere after. after. So then he learns that, that the Tishbois is referring not only to the Kharish, not only to the plowing, but also to the Katsir, which is the harvesting relating to the positive mitzvahs as well. But in the Mimer over here, the Alter Rebbe just, in this Nusach of the Mimer, it says only on the Kharish, not on the Katsu. And this is the meaning of Asidim Tzadikim Shayyim Rulafneim Kadosh. When Mashiach will come, it will be said in front of the Tzadikim Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. The same what we say to God, holy, 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 we will say it in front of the righteous. And who are the righteous? All the Jewish people are called Tzadik. Why? Because by that time, we will have downloaded the Ein Sof to the point that we have so downloaded it that we have become so included in it. Downloading it means that we reveal it inside of us and then we melt into his truth. And at that point, we are him and he is us. So therefore they will say to us, they will say to the tzaddikim, kadosh. Tzaddikim, as we said, all Jews that did mitzvahs. Because we said all mitzvahs are called tzedakah, so those who do it are called tzaddikim. So in the end, what's going to happen? A Jew is going to be assimilated in God, in God's truth, in the Ein Sof. And therefore they will say upon the Jew, Kadosh, Kadosh means removed, infinite, Ein Sof. Through this that we draw down the Ein Sof, who is currently Kadosh, currently he is removed, removed and separated, but we are drawing him down, Lamata below, until we become Kadosh. And with all this, we're going to understand, move on, this is all bringing us back to what the Mimer began with. What is the advantage of Nishamis over Torah? Remember we started with that? That even though there are the queens and the concubines and the girls, but one is my daughter. We understand the quality of the souls of Israel. Torah over the Torah. Even though the Torah emerges from the supernal level of Chachma, and it's plugged into Chachma to a very high level. But when that Chachma comes down, and Chachma is still plugged into the Ein Sof, and it's purely infinite, but when it shines from Chachma to Malchus, what's Torah Shabbat Torah Shabbat is Malchus. It comes down in one specific idea. It was initially in Chachma, it's collected to the general Ein Sof, undefinable Ein Sof. But when it comes down to Malchus, it comes down as one specific halacha. So it's like, he's going to give like a person's hair. You have a general power of your brain, and then you have your hair. Your hair grows next to your brain, because a little bit of your brain energy goes into the tiny hair follicles. But only one minute. Kamayim and Eliyo, Eliyo says, Malchus Pet, Torah Shabbat Pet. And Eliyo, Pasach Eliyo says, that Torah Shabbat Pet is what? Is Malchus. I'll give an example. When you have an idea, perfect example. When you have one idea, you can conceive, let's say when Albert Einstein conceived the theory of relativity. So it's a powerful idea. But then when he translated it into words and into a book, that, those ideas became translated into individual words and letters. 
And every letter contains a tiny crumb of the overall idea. So to every halacha is a tiny crumb of God's infinite mind. And that's why Torah Shabbat pets, the mouth. Mouth is, so what's one idea in your head becomes so many words and, and detail. And every single halacha, Hashem Chines, Nimen Vesaros are little Nimen, little individual hairs. Vedalis Rosh Chakar Gomon, and your hair locks are like purple. Shem Aben Kates, Ain Sof. See? Those that are walking around with purple here on Melrose. Also a reflection of spiritual matters. It says, your hair locks are purple. Kargomon. Keshayiyekach. Yiyadinkach. And what is it? It's an expression of the Ebeshtiz Ratz. When it will be so, the halacha should be so. And this is the idea of what we said earlier. Kamesha Kasev. Alamois ein mispar. There's no end to all the expressions of halacha. Shem halacha is kanal, which are the halachas. Azai then, ein behem teisefes veriboy. There, it's an expression of the divine will, but there's no added, it doesn't grow. It's only according to the halacha. That which is drawn into the divine speech. And it's in that sense, it's almost like the Torah is stagnant. It's like the malachim that are stagnant beings. Like the malachim, the malachim are also drawn from the level of speech. And therefore, every malach is like one letter. And therefore they can't grow, just like, just like a word can't create a word. The word that you emitted is one word, it doesn't create another word. It doesn't have, even though it's an expression of the nefesh, it doesn't have the reproductive ability of the nefesh. Only in the hamshacha that you give to your children, only in the power of reproduction do you have that infinite power. It's not a fixed, limited expression of yourself. In the, in, the, in, the, in the breath of his mouth are all the hosts. There's no addition and there's no increase. A malach can produce another malach. They're the same like the galach that we said earlier that can't have children. That's right, they garnished. It's not, it's not you don't, just, I can't forget the way he said it. You don't reproduce. What's with you? You can't make another malach. They don't have Moshe Rabbeinu said to the malachim, "Do you have period of arivia? Do you have, do you have, right? Do you have?" Ma'ashen ke neshamas Yisrael, which isn't the case of the souls of Israel. Hem dafke mamshichem tamid b'chinas oirin soif baruch hu. They can continuously draw more and more and more. Lamata below aydei mitzvahs ma'asiyas through the physical mitzvahs. Sha'oisim b'chinas riboy v'teisafes from which they do and they don't stop more and more and more. These are the mitzvahs that man should do them. They can't do the mitzvahs. They, the chai behem, and they live in them. They draw energy. What's the chai behem? You draw the ain't self into every mitzvah. Shehem heim amam shich, and they're the ones who draw up chenas chayas moirin seif baruchu, the chayas of the orin seif, into the mitzvahs. Kemoy shekosav asisam oisam atem, because if you make the mitzvah mitzvah, you're right, every mitzvah itself is only one mitzvah, but the neshama can do many mitzvahs. Okay. So that's the mile of Nishamis. So therefore, therefore, you're infinitely greater than, than the than the Malchus and the Achkolze. But the Nisham, in order for the Nishama to be that way. The Pasuk says, Achasi yoy nasi tamasi. First you have to be in a level of dove, then you can do that. Kolza udavkai dey bitl be mesiris nefesh al Yisrael. In other words, put it this way. In order to be able to have that infinite ability, you have to, you have to re, we need, we need to, simply, we need to elevate ourselves back into our infinite source. We need to resubmerge ourselves into because in Ishama, even though it is a point, a point of the Abishter, but as it emerges outward and comes down, it starts also to get a crust. A crust of beingness, a crust of self. And once it gets a crust of self, it can and become part of that Bria Yatsira Asiya, whatever is in the black hole that is disconnected from the Ain Sof, is finite, and therefore just as just as in, Irrelevant and insignificant like everything else. So for the neshama to be able to have that unbelievable ability to transport Ain Sof down here, 
It needs to re-identify with the Ein Sof, and that's Bittel. And that's, that's why you have to say Kriya Shema, that's why you have to daven every day, to raise your consciousness back into the Echad, into the Oneness. And then after davening, you can do mitzvahs. Through the bitl of Mesiris Nefesh of Yidin Mikoidem, you have to say the Vahafta during Shema. And then you're called Achas. One is my bride. You're receiving from the Echod. You're receiving from the Echod. Then you're called Achas because you're receiving that oneness. There you see that the achas of kaf achas is related to the achas yanosi. Okay. For us, I didn't check that up. We taught, I learned that mime already, with, but I didn't now. For us, and only when we reconnect to that source are we able to download Lamata. To unify and synchronize the upper and the lower worlds. In other words, we have to get a Wi Fi signal in order to be able to channel. We have the capacity to channel, but we need to reclaim. So we have to re reconnect. And then, and then we can affect the worlds that the world should not be. We can transport the Echad down here, we can transport Oirin Saif down here. And then the worlds are not going to be any more Alma the Prud of the world of separation. The Nidim, that they should appear, as if there's something separated. Until it should appear like there are two domains, like we learned, we're holding on the next page, like this min, like this apostate said, from your upper half and your lower half, where he created a division. Because above there is absolute unity. Canal, but when it translates and it and it evolves through this chain-like progression below, Mata Mata, it becomes a world of separation. Like we said earlier, where there is period in the lower realms. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be unified. How do we accomplish that? But when the Jewish people, when Yidin are drawing down the revelation of the Orin Saif Lamata below, Gam came Mamish. The same orin sof that's illuminating and shining in the upper worlds we reveal down here through the mitzvahs. So we create this unity between the upper and the lower. And that's called tamasi. We're completing God. We're completing the, the, the thing. There's no break in Him. You're making Him complete. The yichud of the Aryan Soif happens below, as he is above. Mamish. That's why it also comes from the word Tumasi comes from the word you complete me. So if there is a piece in creation that's severed, it's a it's in a sense a a a a, a division in, in God also. Because ultimately it's God's territory, it's God's terrain. If a piece is separated, even if it's in its own consciousness, there's a certain lacking of completion in the Abishter. And that's why we are the ones who complete him. But there's another meaning where also his, we are unified. Tu Masi comes from the word yichud, unity, two, two that become one. Shubchenes yichud zun, man and woman together is called a tamim, complete. Why? Because that means that the world's above Malchus and Malchus even out. Like we say Shabbos, what do we say Friday night? Kegavnon the inun le'elo be'echad, just like it is up there, echad, oifochi letata down here, also beraza the echad. We bring down the echad down here, and then the two are, and we know Shabbos is a time of zivug, a time of, of, of intimacy. Malchus generally is a source of disconnect. Now Malchus is also invigorated and illuminated and enlightened with the unity. Now they become completely unified. Through the Jewish people, as we said earlier. Oh, so that's what we will do. So we need to be achas. But in order to be in a state of achas, one more preliminary thing. We need to first be in a level of yoinasi. Then we can be tamasi. We can make, we can complete a total fusion but we first need to be Yainasi. Before you get married, you first have to be in love with your 
future husband. That's the first stage. Two strangers get to know each other. They get in love with each other. And what's their love? They can't have intimacy yet because they're not married. Their love is they look at each other. And when they look, they, they get such pleasure in just seeing. You know, see a kala and a chasen by, by, their, by their engagement party. You know, they look at each other and they see the lights are glowing with that light. They're like, it's like the biggest pleasure. And I go meet them like 30 years later and then, you know, I'm not really looking, whatever. Go, oh yeah, on the deepest level, everybody's doing that. I know that. But I'm talking about just the practical level. It doesn't always have that same spark. We were supposed to... We're supposed to rekindle the flame and get to that. Fine, I'm given. But we know how it is. The romance that they exist by this new couple that they're just engaged, especially even before they're married, is like that. Wow. And they, they get the biggest pleasure by looking at each other. That's, the, that's as far as they can get. It's just looking. So the same is with Abir. If, if we're strangers with God, if we don't look at him, we're not, then, then we're not going to get intimate with him. We first have to have the idea of a dove. Doves are called lovebirds. They look at each other. They, get, they, they can sit on two branches and look at each other for hours. So this is the idea that before a Yid comes to a state of union with the Ein Sof, you first have to find pleasure in looking at the Ein Sof. Not by learning Hasidus and then thinking about the Hasidus. You're learning, you're looking, you find. And then we look at him and find pleasure and he looks at us and finds pleasure. And that leads to the intimacy and the fusion. So he says, First we need to be doves. You have the eyes of a bird. of a Just like a pair of lovebirds of, of, of uh, doves. Their primary pleasure, who are staklos. They gaze at each other. They look at each other. The same as above. In order that we should get intimate and close. That we should have this unity of Zuchar v'Nuk v'Chas v'Kal. Who I de p'chines yoy nasi mikaidem. First we need to be a Yona, a bird. Shu p'chines atayinug, which is the pleasure. Shat tzarech liyus benish mas Yisrael that there should be in the souls of Israel. Lestakala b'yikara the Malka, in which we gaze at the glory of the King. Shu p'chines his boyinus, which is the contemplation. Begdulas oirin soif baruchu and the greatness of the oirin soif. The nikra, even though we're not yet in a state of fusion, but we're delighting in His greatness. And it's more than just learning. It's like meditating to the point that you can visualize it. That's what listakola means, to visualize. V'nikra simchas kala, that's called the joy of the bride. Shuatai nukshala kala, that's the pleasure of the bride. Mahistakla salachasen, like we find by Rivka last week. You know, when Yitzchak, she saw, and the, the Pasik describes, for the, you only have it then, that she, she sees Rivka, she sees Yitzchak, she's asking, who's that man walking? And she's just, she falls off. She can't even stay on the camel. She's like blown away by his majestic, uh, you know, regality. And that's the estaklis on the chasen, that's the, that's the glory of the king. And through us looking at him, we capture his attention and he looks at us too. The eye of God, God is also transfixed. God looks at the tzaddikim. At those who fear him. And God can't take his eyes off. He like loses himself in like this incredible pleasure and delight as he gazes at the tzaddik. Yereyov, and it says, emphasizes God's love. Hashem's eyes are in those who fear him. What's the emphasis on fearing? Bittal. Hashem, hainu, kishi Yisrael, am lamata tamad v'pchenaz bittal Hashem. What does the Abish find the most attractive about us? Is our bittal to him. This creates an immeasurable pleasure above. It's similar to the idea that Hashem says, I did well. Our look at Him is, oh, our Creator is awesome. His look at us is, what a, what a perfect creation I created. What an amazing being I made. It's similar to the idea that Hashem looks down and He sees whatever He created. It's very good. But it's on a much lower level, because that's in creation. Here we're dealing with Hashem looking at a neshama. Just like a person that receives pleasure from a beautiful keli that he made. Especially if you were the one who made it, you get great pleasure in looking at your craftsmanship. So the same is also God looks down at his perfect creation, which is the, the, the neshama. And he's like, whoa. 
And that's called the joy of the, of the groom. Which is the Atzilus, which is called Chasn. Malashan Chayz Darga. Atzilus is called Chasn because it's Hashem descending to be a Mashpia to the world. Lias Mashpia Lamakar Debiya, to be the Mashpia to creation. Shanikra Kala, that's called Kala, to the source of, the, of Bria, which is the Shechina, which is called Kala. So he's called Chasn because he's, he's descending to be a source to give life to her. The EF Shazois, and they can't have that unity, they first have to have the attraction. And the attraction is the idea of the doves, Mikodim first. And through their joyous gazing of the, of the chasen and the kal, of the groom and the bride, which is their pleasure canal, then they can join together in an absolute fusion. Which is this yichud, which is this unity of male and female. Now, what kind of effect is that going to have on the world? Now, this kamoisha hula is not on this last point. Going back to the general concept that we learned in the Mimer. What's the general concept? What happens now as a result of this intimacy? This intimacy is we complete, we make down here be as as godly as up there, the ain't so fills over here. So what happens then? We fix, this is Gavaldic, we fix the initial problem. What was the initial problem? Why is there a dichotomy? Why is there a split? Because in Ma, because Venar, because when the river goes out of Eden, it's only a river, it's only a ray. That's what we're going to see. It's a, it's a, and therefore, by the time it gets down past the Gan, Misham Yiparet, it gets disconnected. So we have to fix a water, a water flow that the, it should not fork, it should not get separated. So it says, when well, Mashiach will come, there is a prophecy. What's the prophecy? It says, mi Hashem yotza. A wellspring, a spring, a spring, umayon, and it will spring mi beis Hashem from the house of God. Yotza will go out. A spring will come out of the base of Migdash. That's what it says. From the base where it's a spring. The Hishka, and it will give to drink, it will water. As Nachala Shitim, the valley of Shitim. What's the valley of Shitim? That dimension that's, that's Yipare, that's separated. Not only is it separated, but it becomes so separated that it, begin, it, can, it can live in utter Shtus. Shitim Alash and Shtus. And Shittim comes also from the word to step away, Malashin Sota, to be stepped away from truth. And those Olam Asiya Agashmi is called the, it's called the Valley of Shittim. Ah, but once Mashiach comes, the Ori Sof will flood the world. It will even flood the Valley of Shittim. Why? As a result of all of our mitzvahs. So we've corrected... Then Venahar Yotzem Eiden, which did not reach the valley of Shittim, quite on the contrary, because he parade, because it was separated, because it stopped, or it, even if it didn't stop, the energy flows, but not in an apparent way, it eventually evolves into the Nachal of Shittim. It creates the Shtuz. But this will water the Nachal of Shittim. The world will not be separated anymore. Kamoishu Atta as they're now. Like they're now, what does it say? Separated. It will be all be completed. My twin, totally unified. The upper and the lower. That's why all this flooding of consciousness, at least in our neighborhood, is coming from Mayan. Over here. Right down Hollywood, as I mentioned once in Shul a few weeks ago. The Mayan spring, teaching the Alter Rebbe's teachings of the Orin Sov, right down to the Valley of Shittim. This is the Valley of Shittim in its lowest form, down the block. Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood, hollow, empty, no, not garnished. And over here, what has to happen? We, we flood it, we flood it. That's the significance of Mayan. Now we're going to take a break, a challenge break. Everybody earned their challenge. And we, the next piece is, is really almost a new mimer. It's like an explanation. Just on this last point of Mayan and, and, and Nohar. 
it's a very quick read. Don't, don't be intimidated by it being a page and a half. We'll do it very quickly. Um, I just want to say, what's the Chiddush? How is the, the next piece is going to explain how is the problem going to be fixed? How is the Nar Hayoitse Me'eden going to be? What's the Chiddush? What's the, what's the fixing? Are we Torah Mitzvahs? What is changing in the rewiring of things that are, is allowing the finite world to be reabsorbed not to be finite, but to be included in the Ein Sof. The answer is that by the Eden is really the Mayan. What's the Mayan? Mayan is Eden. Eden is the source, the, sp the spring from where all. A river comes from a spring. The spring. But as it is currently, the spring itself, the Eden remains hidden, and only the Nahar goes forth, which is like a ray. And because it's only a Nahar, it's only a river, not the spring itself. It allows for the, the river to dry up in the end, so to speak. It allows for the, the forking of the river into four separate beings. The Chiddush of Mashiach will come is that Eden itself will be revealed. We'll draw the Eden into the Nahar. When the Eden is brought in itself, then, then it never will become Sham Yupari. Problem is the Eden was left behind and only Nohar Yoitzim Eden. And that's the Chiddush. Umayon Yotza. That what's going to come out and emerge outward into the most external, final, final um, stages in the creation, the Mayon, the quintessential beginning, is going to be Mayon Yotza. The Mayon itself is going to come. Like we have over here on the Brea Bullet, that the Mayon itself moved from I die in here. So, you always have to plug. You always have to give. You have to. They told me when I give the shir that I have to do self promotion. My secretaries are telling me they did, but else it's not going to work. Self promotion. So this is self promotion, guys. The Mayan moved over here so that we can flood. L'chaim. What a beautiful mimer. Okay. Let's just take a little break. Four minutes, four minute break, five minute break, and then we'll continue. Another half an hour tops.
<laughs> I did. I just, you know, I kept on adding. I added water. I, and, you know, a little of this. Okay. So let's now continue. Ulahav and betoyz for beer, so to understand a little bit better, Masha, because of this, that it says umayon mi beis Hashem, that the mayon, that the um, spring. Mi beis Hashem from the house of Hashem Yates Yotza went out for Hishka and it will or Yatsay will go out for Hishka and it will water us Nachal Shitim, the valley of Shitim Anemar Allah Asid, which says regarding the future. In the Lukhura in a move in Masha Kasav Umayan Yots Yatse. What does it mean the Mayan will go out? Valoy Nama V Nohar Yotse. A Mayan doesn't go out, a Nohar goes out. Kamasha Kasav and Nohar Yotse may Aden. Just like back then it says that the Nohar went out of Aden. That's the way it should work. The Nohar goes out. The truth is, that's the problem we want to avoid. Is that it, by the Nohar, it says, when the Nohar goes out, it might be a very powerful illumination of the divine, but since it allows for Misham Yiparet, eventually it comes to a state of separation. By the mind, it doesn't say it will separate. On the contrary, Vihishka, it it, it, it brings water, which means it brings life-giving consciousness and, and truth into a place that is completely lacking of it. Ubir, Zeus, an explanation of this. Be understood based on what it says in the words of our sages. Nahara mekipe mevrech. That a... The question over there is if you're allowed to toivel, if you're allowed to dip, if you're allowed to do a tefillah in a river. If you're allowed to, if you have to, the person needs to go to the mikvah, if they're allowed to toivel in a, in, a, in a... So the question is, is it getting more rainwater or is it getting... Wh where is the water coming from? I don't know if you're getting a lot of rainwater then. So the Gemara says, no. Nahara, a river, mekipe, from, its, from within itself, mavrich, it's increasing. V'loi chashinan, and we're not, we, we, don't, we don't worry, shame yarbi, Noitfim that the that the rainwater will become more over the over over the natural water that's in the river. Pidishat Isaf is very law that it is addition and it is increased. Shemasidab Bikeshanasa Nor, which increases when it becomes a river, because initially it's just a bunch of little springs. Then it becomes a river. When it was first in the Mayan, it was a spring. Shemana Yoitzahanor, which from it comes the 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 uh, river umemakoidoi, so this increase. In other words, this increase, because really it's a strange thing. A river is a gushing, powerful force of water. It's like gallons and gallons of water, like rumbling and gushing and. Um, the the, uh, the 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 springs that are feeding the river. Are usually at the same time much less water. Small little, like from a creek from under the ground, they're rowing. Shh. So it seems like it's incomparably more water in the river than there is in the. So he says, but on its own, it becomes increased. Meaning the increasement is when it goes into the river. Like it's almost like there's more water in the river, but it's. It's really being increased by these springs, even though if you look at it in terms of quantity ratio, it's, it seems to be much less. From within itself. Which means the I understand what it means, it's, it's increasing from its edge, it's increasing from below. I don't know what he means with that. Okay. But the main thing is, not from the waters of the rain. Maybe it means to say anything that's it's increasing only from within itself, not from an outside source. Even though the Mayan itself doesn't have such an intense... Im calls it nevertheless achar she yoytze me helem shalamayon. Once it leaves the concealed state of the springs, see this. 
In a spring, the waters are still hidden. It's mainly beneath the ground. It's coming out, just bubbling on the top. And the, but then it goes into a river, it becomes very revealed. And it goes into a reveal, the more expansive, stateliest nor for it to become a river, so then on its own it kind of increases. But Toisephus Meruba becomes far more than it was before. So give an example to understand how does that work? How does that magic happen? That it suddenly increases and it's not from an outside source, from those very and there it's much less. She's going to explain that that the, the, the essentially the waters that are in inside the the, the 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 water inside the ground or in there it really is the amount of water that's outside but it looks much less because it's more humble because it's closer to its source when it goes out of its source it becomes more of an identity more of a presence of an identity so therefore it has an appearance of much more water even though in essence it had all that water, and in a sense, maybe even more when it was in its source. But because the source itself is nullified to its source, it's kind of not showing it. It's not. And it gives an example. Example. There is emotions, and there is, the, there is intellect. Now, generally, everything that we have an emotional excitement about, if we're very, very, very you know, passionate about something, about a certain idea, about a certain philosophy, about a certain movement, about a certain reality, I don't know. People are very passionate. And we're very fired up. Sometimes they get, it gets us so emotionally in charge, we're like, we're full of, we get very angry. Or intense about something. Why are you so intense? Why are you feeling such rage or anger or such, or such excitement? There's an underlying idea, a certain appreciation that you have. Now, obviously, the appreciation that is felt, the excitement that you feel in your heart in, as the emotion, it's sourced where? In the idea. But in the head, in the concept, even though there's excitement there too, the mind is excited, but the excitement is not is not is not is not seen as such a major excitement when it's still in the head stage when it goes into the heart and it goes into the emotion over there it can roar like for example if you're angry about something you can get you can lose your anger the anger can completely consume your person can get, lose control in there you can run into a, a rage of anger in a fit well before this fit, 20 minutes before that, they had this thing bothering them in their head. It, as a concept, as something, they're just perceiving the idea that something is not good, something there, something is upsetting, something that it hasn't yet become. An, if the raging fit that they go into is just a consequence of the mind's re realization and the way they appreciate it in their, in their reasoning, in their mind, then how can it be more than in the, than in the source? This is a source. This is a, this is a preliminary level of energy to that. And whenever a source is more intense than the consequence, the answer is it's just as powerful in the, in the intellect. But in the intellect, it's closer to the soul itself. So it doesn't make such a tzimis out of itself. It doesn't, because it's closer to a higher, to the very being of you. So it doesn't... Once it goes more to the external element, it, it becomes more, more of an emotion, more of a something, and therefore it, it's, it's lacking the bittle to the, and therefore it can become more of an identifiable um, force that's larger, even though it's not really larger, but it appears to be much larger. That's the difference between the river and the Maya. So he explains it away. We'll understand it better between intellect and emotions. Main birth and drawing forth of the midos shall It's from the understanding of the matter. 
Shayamik Pesikhla one will deepen in one's mind, Vyav, and one will understand Shatoiv, who that this thing is good. You saw it in Mamela Bali by Ava, the true color Davidahu. They will it will it will it will arouse automatically in their heart a love and a desire to that thing. Shalazois, that's why we find Bekat and Shasikhla Katan, children that that have narrow minds, ma'oid, very narrow, malahachal, vilahavan to understand and appreciate bigger ideas. They can throw a fit for something very silly. Yeah, a two-year-old, three-year-old. They get they get really, really angry about the silliest thing that they want to. They can look at it. It says, according to a person, Seichel, Yehudalish will be praised the man. What does that mean? Shamidois, Shanikra Ish. Adam is mainly Mochen. The Mochen are called Adam. Ish is the name of a person relating to their. Ish is Meloshan Ish, fire. Fire is the emotions. And may Lord of Venim Shachan Lefi Erech Asechel, they come from the Sechel. Venim Tzamuva Mikal and Alts, understood from all of this, Shakol Ikram Shachas and Midas and Masechel, that the Midas only emanate from the Sechel. The Ava became Nerebuchush. Nevertheless, we see that the emotions are a river and the intellect is a little stream, a little spring. After it comes from the intellect into the heart, it becomes very forceful, and energy-wise it becomes increased. Far more than the way it was when it was still in their intellect. Like anger, and the reason is because in the seichel and that's because in the seichel the mida is still very law hidden. It's there. But it's not be his pashtus meruba kolkach. It's not. I, I made a mistake earlier. I said that because in the intellect it's closer to the soul itself. No, the mida is lost in the idea. The, there's an excitement there because if the excitement is later, it has to be there. But the excitement is more overtaken by the by the essential cognition of whatever it is that you're perceiving as a concept. When it's going outside of its source and it's going out to a place where it can be experienced independently, not with the emo- with the excitement, which is the emotion, can be experienced independently, and therefore not over over overshadowed by its source. It becomes automatically expansive, the chayzik, and with intensity, ava of love, oikas, oikas, or anger, or rage. And the same is also Hanar is the river. Even though its main Hamshacha is from the Mayon, after it goes out from the concealedness of this spring, into the revealed river, automatically it, it increases and becomes more. That the Nar from, with, from its source, Mavrech from itself, it increases. And all this will also be understood above. That the river goes out of Eden and Misham Yipare. Eden is the level of Chachm. It's the highest point of Atzilus, the deepest point of Bittl to the Ein Sof. Where Hashem is Chacham, which is hardly a definition, but even that, not with a knowledgeable wisdom. And therefore, it's all in a state of deep concealment. You don't have yet a specified entity. Everything is still in a very vague, subtle of subtle of subtle. And therefore, everything is in a state of deep potential and hidden state. And it's completely nullified to the innovator of that Chachma, which is the Eberster himself, the Ein Soif. The Chachma is still in a state of Ayin. It comes from Ayin and it itself is in a state of Ayin. Shubchenas Ayin Mamish, therefore it's called literally Ayin Venikra Mayon, and it's called the Mayon Shukadug Mesamayon. Just like the Mayon Shadayin Ubebchenas Helem, just like the spring is hidden. Kanal. Venar Yoytzemeye, then the river is already where it starts becoming more noticeable. The Oyer Eloy Ki, that's a source of creation, that's the energy of creation, which is to specify something. Is becoming more identifiable, more revealed for what it is. Yoitzemayed and not for what its source is. Yoitzemayed no mchenes bina datzilos, which is bina vatzilos she yoitzev and imshach mchenes chachma. It emerges from chachma lahashkais to become the flow of energy into the into the worlds. 
This becomes already the mother of the children, which is the source of the supernal Midas of Atzilus, which are drawn from the Bina of Atzilus. She's called the mother to the children, like Leo is the mother to the six children, the six boys. It's called already Rechovos. What's Rechovos? The broadness of a river. It becomes more, more um, pronounced. It's similar to the Midas that we spoke earlier when they emerge. This is in Chachma itself. This is the Yispashtus of the intellect as it becomes more revealed than the Chachma. Which is still the state of nothingness. Even though the Bina comes from the Chachma. Since it's coming from the concealed to a revealed, Hasaga, where you're grasping it, what's the idea of Bina? Bina is that you can already explain it, you can already give it, you can grasp it, you have already certain definitions to it. Ah, so that makes it more of a yesh, more of a something. So that's why it increases and it seems to be so much more. Just like the physical river, that goes off on the mind, and the midos of the lev that are drawn from the intellect that's in the mind. When they're in the mind, they're in a far more calm state as when they, and, and therefore seem to be much less than when they come out and manifest. That's the reason why the river is already a source for Yipari. Because the river itself has already an identity. In other words, the otherwise Abish there, who's not even a creator, who's infinitely beyond any definitions, is already taking on a life force for something specific in Bina. Not so in Chacham. And because of that, once you have already specified something, it'll, it, it leaves room for more somethingness and more definition and more solidification of that sense of seer, definition, image, style, and therefore eventually it would evolve in a stiff creation that knows nothing but other, other than itself. Since it's coming out from the Bina of Atzilus, which is already a, a state of Yesh, the Pchenas Malchus da Atzilus, it's passing on further into Malchus which Malchus translates the energy further into creation, into Briyatzir So then it becomes completely separated. To create creations that are truly limited, the almond, the pruda, and worlds that are separated. And now it's only after the river moves away from Eden. After it stepped away from Eden, and we came to the Nohar, which is the Bina, and the Midois of Atzilus, and the emotions of Atzilus, and it flows further from them into Malchus of Atzilus, to be enclosed in Bri Yatsir and Asil. Only from there, from this whole process, mainly from Malchus, but already beginning in a subtle way from the Nohar. And from there you part it, in Atzilus itself is still unified, but from Malchus Misham, from Malchus is where the period happens. Aval Etzem Hanor, the river itself, it still retains enough unity, or Bittl Betachlis, and absolute Bittl, like we said earlier, this, even, this, even the Midas, not just Bina, even the Midas are Lecha Hashem. Remember we spoke earlier? Are to you, God. And he and his and his life forces and he and his vessels are still one. Even though it's already drawn from Chachma. So it's stepped away from that Eden. For it to have somewhat more of an identity of a river. The reason why on its own a taka would also become Yesh. But because it's constantly connected to the spring, the river is constantly connected, the, the consciousness of the spring carries over into the river to bring the river also to a state of bittal and unity. Understand? It's the Aden that's, that's impacting the Nahar because the Nahar Yoytse, because the Nahar is constantly coming out of the, out of the Aden. So that's why it's, 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 um, 
it's transmitting this bittel into the Nahar. So what we say, of Chachma is constantly going into Bina. To make sure that Bina doesn't become Chas V'Shalom separated. And comes a source, Shayum Shech Meshama Lamata Bebeyayipareid. It's enough separated that it can start becoming a source that if it will pass through Malchus, it will become distorted completely. It will become Yipareid. Because it went out from the concealed spring, which is a supernal Chachma, which is called Eden, which is still unconceivable and undefinable, to it revealed, and every revealed something, when it's revealed, means it has to have words, it has to have, it has to have kalim, it has to have definitions. And it becomes grasped in Bina. Then it could continue and to evolve further with Simtsumim and more contractions. Until eventually it will come it will it will it will come about to be Nevroim Nefradim to creations that are completely separated. Mamish. they're not truly because everything is still him, but Ki'iluyam Yash Venifrad Bifnayatsmoy. As if they are a Yash Venifrad, as if there is no boss and they're their own boss. And they uh, uh, become separated. But from the Mayan itself, if the Mayan is, 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 is felt, that would never allow them. Meaning, Chachma is not a source for Yeshus. Bina is. Chachma not. Chachma is not a source for, for Pirud. Bina is. It's not a source at all. That they should leave, leave room for Yesh and Nifrad. For, for beingness and separateness. Since the Mayan doesn't have this ispashtus, it doesn't have this presenting itself. Like the river. It's still in a state of ayin. That's the Chiddush of Mashiach, that the Mayan itself will be revealed. The essence of the supernal Chachma Lamata below. The worlds will not feel themselves separated. It, it will be, be below also the yichud of the light of Hashem. Literally as it is above. That's the meaning of the mayon goes out. The essence of the mayon. Which is the supernal chachma. It itself will carry down itself over and will be revealed below. As it is a mayon, not as is it a nahar. The mayon itself will go into the nahar. That only the river departs and goes out, emerges, but the mayon gets left behind. And then it will even give water, bring, bring enlightenment even to the nachal of shitim. Shittim umaloshin shtus. Shittim is from the word shtus. Vegam aloshin shatu aam. Also, the people scattered, which is the idea of pirud. Shem bechinas alma de pruda, which is the idea of alma, the worlds of separation. Venachal a shittim umokar ha magdal kol taivas. What's the nachal? Nachal is the production center, Hollywood, that produces all the taivas for everybody. It's not just, it's, it's one thing that everybody has a taiva. Then there is a center that produces the taivas. So how Magdal called Tivus, they, they make all the Tivus be so like all the delights and all the lusts to be like a whole Matthias. And all the Tanugim of this world that are not for God's sake. It's the difference between the Mayim El Yonim, which are still connected. The, the, the connection, what Mayim is pleasure, pleasure that is connected to Hashem. They're the ones that increase all the pleasures of the world. Which are considered residue. And how do you get the Mayim Tachtoinim? Same idea. How did we get the lower waters, which are a, what, what, what supports all unholy pleasure, all worldly pleasure that is not related to God? It came about through a firmament that separated the higher and the lower. Same over here, like the Mayan states behind and only the Nohar. It's, it's this disconnect. And, and by the way, Rakia is many times explained that that's Bina. Bina is called the Rakia. Firmament. This is what brings below. In the lower waters, the Nachal of Shittim. That's why I'll give an example. Let's translate this into Avoida. Why does a Chassid need a Rebbe? Why can't the Chassid just learn Chassidus? 
That's the point. The Hasidus is the Bina. When you go to the Rebbe, you, he, that, that's, the, that's the Mayan, that's the Nor, and he brings you to Bittal. And infuses Bittal into you, brings the Bittal. With Hasidus, a person can use the Hasidus himself and become a Gansi Yesh. You, you, I can explain God. I can explain on it. And that too is adding to my self-importance. It's Bittal. But that you have to you have to be connected to the Maya, not not just to the Yispashtas. And it's explained over there. When the essence of the Maya will reveal, even the Nachal of Shitim, will have that Gilu of the light of Hashem. Even nations will go to your light. They will come into the clefts of the rocks. Offer into the tunnels. Because of the, the dread of God and from His splendid glory. That's going to be revealed in this word. The world will not be separated. As it is now. We're on the last page and on the last paragraph. In which it appears as if it's too writ. Ri- I don't mean the last paragraph on this page, but the last paragraph of the Mimer. Like there's chas two two domains, as we said earlier, kadas like the like the like the like the opinion of this uh, apostate. Like he answered him, how does he allow water to pass? Maybe it makes sense. Shebe'emes in truth, even even when the world is separated, it's only separated from our perspective. It's never really separated. That means everybody's doing God's bidding, even though when they think they're doing their own bidding. Even, the big, even those that are running around denying God and doing, they're also doing God's thing. In every little thought, speech, and action. So there's no separation in truth, but in their imagination it is. Sheba em has in truth, there's only one boss. Ha kronim shech memen yizbarach, it's all drawn for him. Rak shayi dey ribu yishtalshlos v'tzim tzumim, because of the many yishtalshlos and tzumim, lahalom alahastam as er Hashem, to obscure and to hide the light of Hashem, Amachaya, Mahava Oisam, that enlivens and it creates them, I only yesh from nothing to something. Hem nirim, they appear, Kili, Hem yesh from the Asman. appear to be self, self-sustaining or self-independent uh, creatures. And that's all because everything is only emanating from the river. The river goes out, and Misham Yiparein, it only tells you the source, but it doesn't say anything much more about the source, only that the river emerged from the source, but it's mainly attributing all the water flow to the river. When the essence of the river of the spring itself will be revealed Lamata below, down here will be as godly as up there. Mamish will be just as unified. The world will be separate canal. And how do you bring the Mayan? That's mitzvahs, Torah mitzvahs. And only neshamas have that ability to transport that down here. Because neshamas come from Chachma. As the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, we're children. Children come from the essence of the Father. That's the Chachma. The main Iker of the Masach, of the partition that separates between Atzilus and Bria, between the world of Em and the world of creation, say, Inyan Shahabina da Atzilus, attributed to Bina of Atzilus, Mislabesha Sislapshas Gomer la Chachma, completely hides the Chachma, for he begins Masach Mavdil be Ein Soif for Chachma. And Bina becomes the separation that separates between the Ein Soif, the Chachma, and the Chachma, El Bria to the creation. Masha Ein came by that happens only in the world of Bria, but in the world of Atsilus, Bina doesn't block. Bina Bina does not act as a complete interference. It only passes through her. She's receiving from Chachma, but she's not obscuring it. That's what we mean. The Bina is this river. The Nar itself is in a state of Yash and Hispashtos. But the Chachma is the spring. It's not in a state of expansion. It's a state of silent bittel. It's not the hay. It's not in a state of expansion. It's the Yud. Because it's 
residing right by the source. V'zehu pidish atzilus. That word atzilus, Meloshan etzlo. It's close by. Eitzel hamatzel. It's next to the emanator. So the emanations don't feel themselves because they're next to the emanator. They feel the emanator, not the emanations. That's why it says in Eitzchayim, the slapshus oirin soif bebina or midas tatzilus. That the oirin soif in bina and midas tatzilus, since it's in atzilus, nikreiu vegamu uchad. He's still one with them. Ah, sorry. He's, he's now bringing out another point. Soif calls soif since the be, even though it's an atzilus, so it's one, but it's still a lesser level of oneness than the unity that God has with Chachma. Chachma is a deeper state of unity. It's called Iu v'chiyuhu, which is a separate level. It's on a much deeper oneness, Iyahi and his life forces, which is referring to Chachma, as opposed to the unification of Bina, which is already more of a, perhaps we can say the difference, give an example, of this, this is the example of Hasidus gives between Bittel Hayash and Bittel B'Metzias. So the difference between Min B'Minoi and Min B'Shaloi B'Minoi. If you have a mixture of two substances, so if you have, a, you know, so we say that it's canceled halachically. One, if some, if one, one substance is much more than the other, it's canceled. But it's a difference if it's Min B'Minoi. If it's Min B'Minoi, which means they become totally lost in it, in the point that it doesn't even have any... A Min She'enoi Minoi, when you have one type mixed, if, if, if wine and... and uh, wine and water mixed or, or, or wine and juice mixed, it's not a perfect ju- joining because it's still, if you would, you could still technically with the right uh, equipment which separate the two. So it's just, it's, it's included, it's lost. As opposed to when two things of one mean unify. Chachma is still ayin. So when it unifies with the Ein Sof, it's mamash min b'minoi. Bina is already shtikl metzias. So therefore it's called garmu. It's like, it's like vessels unifying, not like the light. Unifying with source. Shalom Ayelam Abad Regis Gamuv. I'm Sir Shem Beinim Bango. Ella, where he explains over there that Chachma is only Chachma experiences the absolute oneness of God. Bina is already a translation of that oneness. It's not the pure oneness as is. That's what the Alter Rebbe explains over there. Ella Shemakol Makom Bebina Datzilus Atzma. While Bina is in Atzilus, Ubechal Atzilus, and in the whole range of Atzilus, Hoylam Yuchadim Ema Chachma. Since the Bina is still connected to the Chachma. V'nikra hakal atzilus, it's all called atzilus. Ma'ashen kem b'bria, in the world of bria, she'ena mekabeles rak ma'habina lavada. In bria, the, the chachma influencing bina is not felt. It's only the bina on her own. Okay, nemesham yipare, that's why there is separation. Upezeh, yuvan, and this is the maila of neshamis. In yen oyer zaru ala tzadik, what this will understand, that the light that is planted for the tzadik, shal yoyis agilui b'biyah, in order to bring revelation in biyah, we need to access the Chachma back and bring it into Biyah. Gamkin, Kamoy Batzilus Mamish, that in Biyah should have the same revelation in Briyat, like in Atzilus, that Daika Yedei Nishmas Yisrael. Only Nishamas can do so. Shehem Chinas Oyer on Israel, Lamata, they are this, the light that is, they are light that is planted below the Slavish Beguf to be clothed in a body. Finally, the Fish in Nishmas Yisrael, Olu B'Machshava, they rose in Machshava. Where's, where's Olu B'Machshava in Chachma? Ta'ainu Ba'atzmi Yis Chachmi Allah. We originate in the deepest point and in the essence of Chachma. And therefore, our capacity for Bittal, the deepest Bittal is in the Neshama. And that's why only we can blow away the Yashas of the world. And that's why everybody hates us. No matter what, where, and when. They asked the Rebbe once if there can be a Holocaust, if the nations would ever do it again. The Rebbe said, tomorrow. The Rebbe explained other places that it will never happen because Mitzad the Abish there will never happen. But Mitzad, the hatred, you see, it's a modern world, sophisticated. Save the, the, the who knows what kind of species needs to be saved and people will do anything. But there is a hatred to Jews that goes beyond explanation. It's, it's, it's this, because we bring Bittal into the world and not everybody's excited about Bittal. And, and, it, and what kind of reaction does it create, Bittal, when you bring Bittal? To the one who doesn't want Bittal, it creates an irrational hatred that is infinite. That's it's like, it's, 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 it doesn't know Because you, you're, 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 you're contradicting my entire sense of identity of self. And I can't even explain why. Understand the depth of this? 
Until Mashiach comes, there will never be rid of anti-Semitism. Mashiach will come, then they'll appreciate that we liberated the whole world from its, its being stuck up in itself. Uh, so they'll welcome. If they won't welcome it, they're bumped. But uh, that's the idea. But that's that, that's the that, that's the problem. That's where the Jew. That's where the Jew is. The entity of bit. But the, the beauty of the Jew is that he straddles the most deepest point of existence with the most external point. Because the Jew, where does the Shama end up? In a body, in a physical material that's the most period. They can reveal the revelation of lower in and therefore the result will be your master won't hide from you anymore. Because there won't be any more, the petition will be completely blasted through. Because the Mayan will come out. That's what I think it is. Because the oyer ain't soif himself is malubish in chachma da'ak v'chachmezum is labesh as ba'atzilus ayn shal. While that is a mamash yiyah gilu yibabiyah. And the same revelation will be in biyah. V'zehu shalman azal pasik ki b'ka Hashem tzurei lamim. That's where we understand the difference between what Chazal say, it says in the Pasuk, with Yud Ke Hashem created the world. So it says, with He Hashem created this world, and with the Yud Hashem created the future world. What's Olam Abba? Olam Abba means down here after Mashiach comes. It's created with the Yud, meaning it's created from the Mayan. The Mayan is the Yud, the point of Bittu. Created from a He is the current state. It's created from the Bina, which is already a... Is already a, 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 a has already a identity. It's already a something, as opposed to chachma, which is bottle completely. So that's the difference between being a yud, and therefore the effects are: if you're created from a yud, all of creation is a yud. If you're created from a hay, which is expansion, all of creation is in a state of expansiveness into itself. I don't mean a positive expansiveness. Uh, uh, yeah. That's the bina. That's because of the period. This is this world. That's the mayon. It doesn't have an espashtus like the hay. The future world. That's when the mind will go out. Look in all those places and you sure will be illuminated. Okay, now after this he has a beer on it. I didn't learn the beer and I'm not planning to learn it tonight. But this is the Mimer by the Baruch Chasana. It wasn't by the, I think it was by the Sheva Baruch. I think it was Shabbos. Some of it is the parentheses, Hagos, which is the Tzemach Tzedek. The, the Mimer is very, very, there's a very short version. In, in, there were different kaisvim, different writers. So, for example, Rapinchas Reuzes was one of the writers, and his version of the Mimer is literally tiny. Mamash, it's constant. You got all the points, but without any. Or I think so. Yeah, if the Shabbos for sure, they, they memorize. Right? Yeah, the Rebbe also had that. Writers who would sit and remember. And remember, the Rebbe had. The Rebbe spoke six hours, and they remember it. Um, let me just find it over here. I thought it's right at the beginning. Osamachi. It's Mamash, yeah. The whole Mimer is just a page and a half. No, two page. Uh, two, meaning one one daf, both sides of an alpha and a base, and a tiny bit. 
That's the, that's, that's the original Maimah, but very, very, con- the writer wrote very bekitzer, very concentrated. The Mitla Rebbe's version, for example, is always more berachoy v'sanor. Mitla Rebbe is the bina of Chassidus. He's bechlal and oifin of his pashtas. Yeah. Baruch Hashem, it's always so good. Baruch Hashem. And every week, it's that week is the best. Okay, you, you want to lock the door if you remember. Thank you. Now we got a little three prokim rambam. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, we heard we finished the hard prokim yesterday. It says we are now live on your channel, Man Yisrael Live. That's what my email says. I better shut the thing because we're still live. Mm-hmm.